There are other counselors joining us, and the um, time for calling together is 6.30 p.m. Uh, let me just start by sharing my hoped for timing. It's ambitious. If we stick to it, we're out of here at 10 o'clock. But let me use this as an opportunity to just say, after the announcements, we'll be moving to the hearing of the zoning bylaw. Upon closing the hearing, we will immediately proceed to item 7A1, where we ask the council to officially conduct the second reading of the zoning bylaw. And then this will be followed by 7A2, which is adopt an adoption of the zoning bylaw. Um, after that, we will resume the agenda in the order, at least that's the plan for now. Uh, let me just mention that the council will meet on, will not meet on August 5th. Uh, the council will meet on August 19th. We will begin at five o'clock. The major goal of that meeting is the evaluation of the town manager. However, and therefore the first part of the meeting and maybe later in the meeting is pretty boring because basically you sit here and watch us read, which we all learned at an early age, thank you. And then, however, at 6.30, we will stop and do some small amount of business and reconvene to go back to reviewing the town manager no later than 7.30. And their council may require additional reading time, but at some point in the evening, as president, I'll ask the council to discuss the draft memo summarizing the key points of the evaluation. Um, just as an aside, we have solicited and received staff comments, town committee comments, and public comments, and that period of public comment and staff comment is closed. The council will again meet on Monday, May, August 26th at 6.30. We will take up normal business and at no later than 7.30, go again to the town manager review. And at the end of that session, we will go into executive session to discuss the town manager's compensation package. Um, the town council will meet on Monday, September 9th at 6.30 and the agenda will follow its usual outline. So we are going to begin um, our meeting tonight with a hearing. Um, this is, this hearing, this is a hearing to determine whether the town council should amend the town's zoning bylaw by repealing the existing zoning bylaw and adopting a new zoning bylaw. The action is the result of a change of government when the town adopted its new charter last year. Specifically, this public hearing is to review the June 12th, 2019 recommendation of the planning board that the town council vote to amend the zoning bylaw by repealing the zoning bylaw in its entirety and adopting a new zoning bylaw, including amendments recommended by the bylaw review committee. That those will bring the zoning bylaws into confirmation with the Amherst Home Rule Charter that was adopted by the community on March 27, 2018. Mass General Law Section 40A, Section 5, states that no zoning ordinance or bylaw or amendment thereto shall be adopted until after a public hearing is held, at which interested persons shall be given an opportunity to be heard. But the planning board held its public hearing on June 5th. Mass General Law also requires that the notice of the public hearing be posted not less than 14 days before the hearing, both in the town hall and published in newspapers. That was done by posting both online and outside the clerk's office on July 1st and published in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on July 8th and July 15th, 2019. That was so that we would have this hearing tonight. Um, Charter section 2.10 requires reading of any proposed bylaws at two separate council meetings. The first reading took place on June 17th, 2019. The second reading will take place tonight. Um, and then this charter section 2.10 also requires a proposed bylaw to be published on the town bulletin board not less than 14 days prior to its final passage. So in other words, it will be posted after this for 14 days. We will require, when we get to the vote, we will require nine votes, and we will begin with a presentation, brief as it will be, 
by Bob Ritchie, Chair of the Bylaw Review Committee, and Chris Bestrup. Okay. Good evening. Uh, to cover the, the ground that we've been over before, the uh, you, proposal. You need to move your mic a little closer. Out. Thank you. The uh, proposal before you is to act on a repeal and replacement of our zoning bylaw. Now, this is a partial delivery of a product that was mandated by the charter uh, and tasked to the bylaw review committees that have existed to carry out that mandate. Uh, the process has been long. The committee uh, met over a, a long period of time. And the mission uh, basically was to bring the bylaws into conformity with the new charter. And also, uh, importantly, to fulfill or more implement, implement the charter, uh, which is a charge that was encouraged uh, to be broadly construed so that we could uh, migrate from mere uh, uh, secretarial changes to the text uh, to, to make it into a document that is more useful uh, for the charter and the town going forward. And so you have before you tonight uh, a draft of what we hope to be a baseline document that carries forward substantively all of the provisions of the zoning bylaw that we have known and loved all these years through amendments uh, up to the time of the charter change. Uh, just to make a point of it, there have been no changes since the charter has taken effect. So this will be the first uh, legislative action with respect to the zoning bylaws since the charter took effect. It basically replicates the old bylaws with those necessary changes that were forced uh, by the language of the charter, uh, obviously changing the name of select board to town council or town manager, things of that sort. Uh, so we have actually done that. The committee's methodology was basically iterative and it focused uh, on the general bylaws and the zoning bylaws, both of them being bylaws, uh, with a most, almost substantially all of our time devoted to the general bylaws, which by virtue of their uh, history and the evolution of the bylaws into what produced something like a relatively unorganized body of law. The zoning bylaw, on the other hand, uh, was uh, highly developed, it's internally consistent, it has a rational plan of organization, it has a rational alphanumeric uh, outline to it. So the, the uh, attentions of the committee to the text of the zoning bylaw that you have uh, have relatively few changes, uh, uh, and those were those, of course, mandated by the charter, uh, and, and a few others that, uh, that the, the committee felt were appropriate to fulfill the second charge of the committee to make it a more useful uh, document and to better implement the charter. And those were largely uh, uh, reorganizing the text, for example, taking uh, disparate provisions relating to marijuana and aggregating them into one section so that logically it, it fit within the body of the bylaws as we had. Uh, so those were relatively uh, few changes, and I think you've had documents that uh, summarize them, and you have available to you the red line strikeout track, track changes version. Uh, and those are the, uh, the changes that, that uh, you will see reflected. Uh, one semi-substantive change related to the manner in which uh, uh, associate members were appointed, but that was uh, minor, but fulfilled the intent of, uh, of the thinking on how zoning boards and planning boards were constituted under the new charter, but with the, uh, the role of associate membership being fleshed out uh, so as to be consistent with the way we have actually done it in practice. So uh, having complied with all of the procedural prerequisites for council action, uh, uh, it, it, it strikes to the committee that the matter is, uh, uh, is poised for action by the council. Okay. Let me just make note that since the first reading, uh, there have been changes to the cover page, to page 92, section 8.21, reference to general bylaw changing back to the original wording, page 94, section 8.42, reference to general bylaw changed back to original wording, 
page 98, section 10.01 and 10.02, as mentioned before, clar clar clarification of the ZBA and planning board membership and appointments, and page 117, section 12.58, reference to the general bylaw, changing it back to the original wording. We'll start with questions from the council. Okay, then we'll go to questions from the audience. Oh, I'm sorry, Alyssa? No? Okay, we'll go to questions from the audience. And see none, then we'll go to, are there any people who would like to make statements in favor of this change? In opposition. Then um, we'll go back to any further uh, questions from the council. Alyssa. One thing I'd like the council to see the next time we look at a zoning bylaw is the steps that we need in order to do this. You went over a lot of information verbally that we don't have anywhere in writing, and so I would find it very helpful myself to know where we're at at, at any given point in the process. But to this, in this particular case, of course, we've had to postpone, et cetera, and so that's fine. But the next time, because we know, for example, that the planning board's working on some zoning materials for the fall, which is why we're trying to get this all set, right. for them to work from a clean copy. But when that happens, we need more information about a, you know, a joint hearing, for example, as we've discussed here before, mm -hmm. et cetera. We need a written document to follow because we need a written document to follow because the documents we have in here I've been looking at this a while, and I find it a little confusing to know where we're at at any given point. So I would appreciate having such a document. Okay. Any other further comments at this time? Just have Dorothy. It. So one of the purpose, I'm assuming that one of the purposes of doing this, uh, besides getting it um, coherent with the new charter form of government, is that um, when we look at the zoning bylaw, um, it's in a clean state so we can then think about how we would like to change it. Is that correct? Yes, the alternative would be to make these changes incrementally, which leaves us with a range of confusion about the, uh, uh, the uh, birth date of the document. Mm -hmm. uh, since there are internal cross-references that we want to be consistent throughout the, the body of the law, we'd like to have a clean new baseline document to work with. Yes, Chris. I do have a clean copy, both electronically and in paper, if you'd like to see it. I can the pass The board this was provided, the uh, council was provided with both a marked up copy and a clean copy. Okay. I would like a clean copy. It's, it was in your packet, I believe. Yes, well, it it's, it's, it's online. Yes. Yes. I, I, I like paper sometimes. Okay, we'll get you one. We can provide that. Yeah. Fine. Pat. Mike. Um, I want to thank you, um, uh, Bob Ritchie and Bernie Kubiak and Jeff Kravitz for all the work you've done. I know that Alyssa and Evan and I um, have put in a little bit of time, but you folks have really carried the burden, and, and I'm grateful, and I think the document is well uh, edited and uh, taken care of. So thank you. Yep. Back at you, thank you, Pat, and also Lisa. Uh, as being members of the second committee, uh, we've really made progress with the inputs uh, and uh, improved our ability to uh, reconcile and coordinate with the functions of the council and the legislative prerogatives of the council, so we weren't acting in isolation. So having you on the committee uh, really elevated our efficiency, I think. I want to just second all of those thank yous to every one of you, both in the past committee and now the present committee, because this is no small job and you still have the other bylaws to go. So, um, are there any other questions from the council? Hearing none, then we're going to declare the hearing closed and we are going to immediately move to item number 7A on our agenda which is the official second reading of the bylaw. 
And again, is there any further council discussions? Okay. And then, um, if not, we'll move to the adoption of the proposed zoning bylaws. And the motion as it reads is to adopt, uh, there is an actually a very long motion and it's in your packet. And it was reviewed by the town attorney and includes a variety of statements uh, regarding uh, the work that was done and concludes with the statement, now therefore, be it ordered by the town council of the town of Amherst that the Z Amherst zoning bylaws be amended by deleting the current zoning bylaws in their entirety and inserting in place thereof a new zoning bylaw in the form set forth in the document attached hereto and incorporated by reference entitled Complete Zoning Bylaw July 2019 and further to authorize the town clerk following cons consultation with the town manager to make sure ministerial ministerial and clerical changes of form only with respect to identification of articles, chapters, sections, sub subsections, paragraphs, and subparagraphs as are needed to bring such bylaws into accord with the format of the bylaws of the town of Amherst. Is there a motion? Second. Second. Pat, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 That was unanimous. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are 10 ayes. There abstain. Noes, I'm sorry, no, and then abstain. No noes, no abstention, and three absent. Okay. We're going to move on to the rest of the agenda as it appears. The next uh, portion of the agenda is public comment. There are two other times during the um, period of the agenda that we will have public comment. One is for item 5A, and the other one is for 6C. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to other than those two items on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, then we're going to move on to the proclamations and commemorations. And the first is the res resolution in support of the Roe Act. And I've asked the petitioner, one of whom is Pat DeAngelis on the council, to have some summary remarks, and there might be one other person to comment. So please come forward and identify yourself. State your name, where you live, and also sign into the sheet there. Hello, my name is Lynn Morgan. I live at 34 Cherry Lane in Amherst. I've been a resident of Amherst for 26 years. I'm a medical anthropologist and the author of two books and many articles about reproductive politics. So I thank you very much for considering this resolution, which was introduced on the recommendation of Councillor Pat DeAngelis to affirm support for access to safe and legal abortion in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the United States. Why the need for this resolution? Because as you doubtless know, new abortion restrictions have been enacted in several states. And because the administration is trying to restrict access to abortion, contraception, and other reproductive health services. Second, because some Massachusetts abortion laws are outdated and need to be strengthened to protect the rights, especially of pregnant minors and those diagnosed with fatal fetal anomalies. And third, because we want to support pending legislation to ensure that Amherst residents, no matter their age, income, or insurance, will always be able to access safe and legal abortion. So one of the questions that came up was why the town council should consider this resolution since laws are made at the state level and the federal level and not at the council level. And there are various answers to that question. One, because this affirmation helps to destigmatize abortion and supports the Amherst residents who in our lifetimes will avail ourselves of abortion services. 
Second, because it supports our elected officials who represent us at the State House and the Capitol. Our backing helps them, and it urges them to act. And third, because you won't be alone. Many city and town councils across the United States have passed similar resolutions just this year, including Northampton and Somerville, Massachusetts. So what does this resolution ask you, the members of the Amherst Town Council, to do? One, to commit to protect our rights to make our own reproductive decisions. Two, to support passage of state and federal legislation as outlined in the resolution. And three, to share this resolution with our elected officials. I would like to thank you for considering this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I just received, before I came here tonight, a note from Mindy Dom, who would have liked to be here, but she's still on her way from Boston. So she asked if I would read this statement that said that she wanted to thank the community members for leading this effort to get a local resolution in support of the Roe Act at the state level. As a co-sponsor of the Roe Act and a strong supporter of abortion access, it was a great honor, she writes, to stand in support of the bill at a public hearing several weeks ago. Close to 30 state legislators stood in support of the bill, and one of the more meaningful experiences I've had in the State House was that as we each introduced ourselves, we identified the towns we represent. From Framingham to Amherst, the Merrimack Valley to New Bedford, the roster of towns represented was stunning. I believe the local resolution can be helpful in expressing our community's shared concerns and beliefs, and ultimately in demonstrating local support for this statewide initiative. It says our town is a vocal leader for reproductive justice. And during these challenging times, that voice can use every megaphone available. This resolution is one such megaphone. Thank you. And I'd like to turn the mic over to my colleague, Dr. Miranda Balkan. Thank you. Please. Thank you. My name is Miranda Balkan. I live at 591 Bay Road. I'm a family doctor. I'm the former past president, past president of Medical Students for Choice. And I both live and work here in Amherst. The decision to continue the pregnancy or to have an abortion belongs only to the person who is pregnant. Nobody else but myself and the patient belongs in that decision-making process. An abortion is a medical procedure and a common one. We see about a million abortions per year in this country, which means that about one in four American women will have one by the age of 45. I do not have termination statistics for transgender patients, but I do know that LGBT teens are actually more likely to get pregnant or cause a pregnancy than their straight cisgender counterparts. The anti-choice faction is saying that the Roe Act allows infanticide in the case of accidental delivery of a live fetus. This is simply untrue. In the first place, Gonzalez v. Carhartt requires us to stop the fetal heartbeat before performing a termination. In the second place, it is always the choice of the parent whether to resuscitate a preterm infant with little hope of a normal neurologic outcome, regardless of what the desired pregnancy outcome may have been. Abortion is a social justice issue. Abortion allows girls and women to achieve their life goals, education, career, and more attentive parenting to the children they already have. In this decade, abortion has become concentrated among poor women in the United States. 49% of all abortions performed are performed on people who live below the federal poverty level. Abortion is safer than pregnancy, particularly when it is done early. Studies have consistently failed to show any adverse mental health, mental health outcomes related to abortion. 90% of abortions take place in the first trimester, and the rate of medical complications, most of which are quite minor, is about 2%. Fewer than one in 100,000 abortions ends in death, whereas the maternal mortality rate for this fair nation is 26.4 per 100,000. Perhaps our most vulnerable population for complications is teenagers. One in five girls ages 15 to 19 who is sexually active will become pregnant, and most of those pregnancies are unintended. Adolescents have been shown to be at increased risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes ranging from preeclampsia to preterm birth, fetal growth restriction, and infant death. The consequences carry far forward as both parents of a teen pregnancy are less likely to complete their education and more likely to live in poverty. The children are more likely to suffer from poor physical and cognitive health, more likely to be abused or neglected, and less likely to complete high school. Parental notification laws do not protect the current or future physical or mental health of our teenagers, and it is time we overturned ours. The Roe Act allows us to strengthen our state's commitment to the well-being of all of our citizens. Thank you for your consideration. Are there questions or comments from the council? Dorothy. Just to add my support for the 
um, amendment for the motion and to say that um, we can't have a modern society if women don't have control over their own bodies. And I'm a very pro-child person, but that means every child should be a wanted child. And without abortion, cheap, easy, and available, we can't have that. Are there other comments or questions from the council? Dorothy? Darcy. 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 I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank the uh, petitioners for, for coming with this resolution. I think it's extremely important and that we can't underestimate the importance of providing support to our state legislators when it comes to this type of issue. They really need to show that citizens and municipalities are behind them. So thank you. Are there other comments from the council at this time? Okay. Thank you. Are we ready to vote? Okay. Are there other public comment? Excuse me. Are we having trouble, Mr. Bacalan? Okay. No? We're fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, then uh, do I hear someone making the following motion to adopt the resolution in support of the Roe Act as presented? Same. Pat and seconded. Dorothy. Yes, seconded. Okay. Any further questions? Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So it's seven, uh, 10 in favor. No against, zero, abs zero abstain, and three absent. Okay. Uh, I, I want to thank you, um, but state that we really ask people not to display publicly their approval or disapproval. <laughs> but on that note, um, we want to thank you for bringing this forward. Have a nice evening. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on from this uh, to the presentation and discussion. The first one is the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And this is Jack Jemsick and Christine Gray Mullen, who at our request are coming forward with their report. And we will um, have an opportunity to ask questions and hear what you have to say. Jack Jemsek, I'm the commissioner for Amherst for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and I guess it's been several years since I've uh, been the commissioner. Uh, the Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission takes on quite a bit of, of uh, their mission is, has many bullets. Uh, they come up with resolves uh, each year in terms of what they want to focus on, uh, but they uh, are an advocate for the region and provide a great amount of assistance uh, to the towns. Uh, if you have your packet, um, we have uh, a letter entitled Report to Town Council regarding Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So uh, I could read it, but I, I hope I don't have to. <laughs> um, but basically, if, if anyone has any questions, I, we, we put a lot of detail in here. Uh, and then also we have, uh, we have listed the interactions between uh, PVPC and the town of Amherst on a number of things, the Joint Transportation Committee, uh, the Valley Bike Share, Local Technical Assistance, Hazard Mitigation Plan, Downtown Retail Assessment Report, Municipal Vulnerability um, uh, Program, Community Choice Aggregation, uh, Task Force Meetings, uh, more with Bicycle Pedestrian, uh, and then there's a PVC Valley Development Council, 
that uh, the planning department attends and just a number of other Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission sponsored events. In addition, I, I, I took uh, notes basically from the agenda and impressions that I had for you know, during the attendance of the four to six meetings that we have uh, the, that are not a, the executive meetings, but just general commissioner uh, meetings. And I could go over high points uh, on that. And then obviously I think this all, you, the interest was peaked because of the executive director. Um, uh, uh, Tim Brennan had been there for 40 years and it was, uh, uh, if you've read the papers, it's an interesting process because <laughs> uh, they've never had to elect a director before and they had some bumps in the road. Uh, but uh, uh, Kim Robinson was, was voted unanimously last week, last uh, Thursday, by the commission. 18 uh, commissioners were there present. It was 18-0. And I think Wayne Fyden removed his name uh, from that second vote. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the uh, what was it? It was a secret ballot. It was just, wasn't done properly. <laughs> I think the main point is that they haven't announced an executive director all, but they're still moving on the selection process, and now they're in discussion with her whether or not she wants to do the job. So nothing's been announced. Everything that's in the paper is basically what we know. This is Christine Gray Mullen. <laughs> I'm the ultimate. Right. Okay, questions? Yes, Pat. Your, your mic. If you could clarify for me, the region, I realize that you work regionally, which is an excellent idea, but can you address uh, how you're looking at homelessness and affordability? Well, there's a lot of programs. They, they're, um, I think they're, they're always looking for you know, supporting uh, the towns in different social justice uh, measures. Uh, one of the first ones I, I uh, meetings I attended, the topic was uh, food, getting proper food out to communities that, that might be below the poverty level. You know, your, your average convenience store uh, doesn't necessarily serve uh, the most healthy of foods. And so that was something they took on. Uh, I know um, there's the domestic violence program there, which is quite unique if you look at other regional planning commissions. Most don't really take that on, um, and I and I'd, I'd actually have to do some research to go more than that. But I know that that um, that component is 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 strong within the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, yes, I would recommend if you have specific issues that you want to look at that the PVPC works on to go to their website. And there's a pull-down menu of specific things, and there's also a tool that you can utilize that you can pull up per community, at, you know, meaning Amherst or other ones, or it can pull up all 43 and give you data. So I highly encourage all of you to go to their website. Um, if you're looking for data, they have it. That is their specialty. And they have many initiatives going on with, with housing, but we wouldn't actually get involved with that. It's more that you know, they finish with a report or a project and they either present it at the meeting we attend or on some cases we might vote on to accept a report or something. But we don't usually get involved in the, in the work. They have people that do that. Additional questions? Yes, Darcy. Hi, I'm just interested in, in uh, hearing about um, the criteria that you used in voting the, in the first round for the director, how, how did you come up with <laughs> your reasoning for how you were going to vote? I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, first off, it's still a legal issue right now. Um, there's been some open meeting law violations with the whole process, and like Jack explained, it was the first time they've ever tried to do this. Um, so there have been some, as he said, some bumps. So um, with that and how it's not final yet, we feel sort of uncomfortable. We know what's basically been in the paper and, and we're not privy to any other information. So um, 
there was an, a closed vote before, and then that was removed. So then they did an open vote, but Mr. Fiden removed himself, so there was only one candidate, and 18 of the commissioners were there last week to vote, and they voted unanimously. But again, that doesn't make that the executive director. It's just one more step in the hiring process. I, I would say that both candidates were highly qualified, though. Yeah. It was a, it was, um, I don't think the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission could have gone wrong with either. I agree. So. Completely. And I, am I correct that the next step is that they will begin the negotiation process with the candidate? Correct. That's what it said in the paper. <laughs> okay. Steve. So thank you for coming. <laughs> And um, so a couple of comments. So I was the PVPC commissioner from Amherst for a little bit before you guys, actually. And there, there are a couple of things, a couple of observations. So PVPC, in a way, serves as a, almost like a de facto planning advisor for communities that don't have their own planning staff. So that's a really important role. So it was never clear exactly what the role in places like Amherst and Northampton and Springfield that have fully formed, you know, uh, planning departments, you know, other than technical advisories, things like that. But in a way, your being here tonight answers one of my questions, which is since the PVBC is dealing with issues that are often much larger than what the planning board deals with, like the location of the Amtrak line, um, I was the, the um, neurotic rail trail. I mean, these are the um, so the projects are really regional, often way beyond the jurisdiction of planning boards. How do, how do we, the town council, stay informed on important issues? So like the inclination of a PVPC commissioner may be to pay attention to the issues that deal with planning, but not necessarily the issues that are larger or different than planning. So that's question one. Question two is, to that same so a lot of the action at the PVPC happens on the executive committee. So, so to me, the executive committee always is like one of those circus hat tricks where there's like a limited number of people and the hat keeps getting passed around in a circle. But it would be great if somebody from Amherst, and I'm looking at you two, could ever volunteer and get yourselves onto the, onto the executive committee because I think that can also help shape the directions that PVPC takes. Did you want to respond to either of those, yeah, please? Yeah, the, the annual meeting was in uh, June and the executive uh, committee was elected then. And uh, I don't know that it's entirely an open process. And I did talk to Tim Brennan and I thought it was interesting. I actually have notes here about uh, how that, that happened and, and what the qualifications of the people uh, on there. And there's, I think there's about seven. Uh, and they do have a lot of years into the Pioneer, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, the chair has 11, another person has 13, 10, 5, 19, 25 years, 9 years, 8 years, 13 years. So uh, it's a very seasoned group there. This I, is on their on planning boards. And yeah, and they're, they're, yeah. they're all uh, you know, on planning boards. And, and uh, Tim did say like the smaller towns are electing their uh, planning boards and the, the the larger towns and cities are appointing uh, them, but um, I think Tim uh, knew I was you know curious about <laughs> about the process, and I did talk to Walter Gunn, who's the chairman there. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a little bit there, there's a lot that goes on. I definitely agree with Steve in, in that regard, um, and yeah, so, and, yeah. sure. So I, I think part of what we're saying is the executive committee pretty much has people who have been on their planning boards for over 10 years. Um, and we might be invited at some time to be on an executive committee, but right now we're as senior members of the planning board, we have three or less years of experience. So, you know, we're newcomers at this and we're still learning a lot. And I think it's about what you can bring to the table to contribute and not just, you know, be there and listen or get, Yes, Dorothy. Um, does Amherst, the town of Amherst, pay into the um, group? And how much is that? And I guess I'm really wondering, what do we get for the money? 
Yeah, um, I would refer to Chris or Paul. I think we just got a, uh, an invoice from them. It's a, on a per capita basis, I believe. Chris. Chris Bredstrup, Planning Director. Um, it's a little over $6,000. I think it's something like 6500 I don't have the exact number, but the Planning Board did receive a letter, a copy of a letter that was sent to the assessor, um, I think, last month. So it's about that amount. Based on the population. It's yes. based on the population. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Yes. It's maybe more a question for my colleagues than for... Um, the two of you, but um, how do we keep abreast of, or do we want to keep abreast of what PVPC is doing? Is yeah. it, do we expect the commissioner to say, would we invite the commission to come here once a year and just sort of give a brief report? Uh, does it come through uh, Chris Brestrup and her planning department? Um, I guess I'm asking all of you, uh, or do we do this on our own? I mean, obviously the website's a place that some of us should begin exploring. Um, but uh, would it make sense on a yearly basis to have someone uh, speak to us about what uh, has happened this year with PVPC since we pay into it and since it's a regional body um, and we want to think large at times? Um, so I guess it's a question for the rest of us um, just to ponder. Uh, will we ever see these commissioners again? Uh, <laughs> uh, unless, <laughs> until the next uh, head is elected? I hope not, but uh, so I'm just wondering. Okay, so one of the questions that um, this brings up is in fact how we can keep in regular contact with you, and not just on the issues that relate to planning, but also on issues that would maybe not be seen as planning board issues, but also issues that might be of more um, immediate uh, importance to us as a town. And I think that it was first um, Steve that asked that we hear from you. And given that we're a new council, that seemed like a good idea. I think what we would like to do is figure out how we can hear from you regularly and also be assured that as issues arise within the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that um, you bring them to the attention of the president of the council and the attention of the town manager immediately so that if we need to weigh in, we have an opportunity to do so. Um, are there other comments or questions? Yes, Alyssa. So following up on that, one of my questions back when we were still developing this visit that we so kindly were provided in the lots of written documentation that you gave us, thank you very much, is that our new charter does say that unless otherwise provided, blah, 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 the town manager serves as the town liaison to any regional entity. And so we had, uh, it had been asked by me in email to ensure that it's okay, because it usually is, but I don't know if there's a rule in state law associated with this, that the town manager can delegate that mm -hmm. because this is different. I mean, with it, mm -hmm. what they are doing is great and that's what we've been doing for a while. Right. But um, although a select board member at one point was also engaged as, a rep, as an alternate. And so one way of knowing what was happening would be if the town manager was going, that would answer the question, right? Mm -hmm. We would already know. But if he'd like to delegate that still because of all the involvement with the planning board, I would totally understand that he wanted to. I hope that one, that's uh, allowed legally, and it's fairly clear that Pioneer Valley Planning Commission may not have the answer to that themselves, but that maybe our legal counsel has the answer to that. And then that would help us figure out this information flow back and forth too. Yes. So I think we do want some clarity on particularly, I guess it's the alter alternate appointment because the planning board appointment is a given, but it's the alternate appointment. And since it appears that Christine, you as an alternate have been attending as regularly, frankly, as just, right. the two of you both go, which is excellent. I, I'm just, um, I, I have very long ago history with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission when they were doing the plan for progress. Now we're talking ancient times. Um, so it does seem to me that uh, in fact, I'd like to ask the question, in the last couple of years that you've been representing us, are there specific issues that have been very relevant to Amherst? Second of all, are there ones that you think have been particularly critical to the Valley that you found difficult to deal with? 
there, uh, there's, I, I come away from some of the meetings and um, I'm enlightened because uh, you, you know, here we are in Amherst and you realize like some of the hill towns, it's a total different uh, story there in terms of their needs. And, um, and, and I have to admit that they, they pull in uh, policy issues you know, from, from Boston uh, early in the process of things that you, you wouldn't necessarily know. I don't, the, the average person wouldn't know that certain policies are going on there, you know, ranging from you know, energy uh, uh, to the marijuana uh, uh, you know, regulations and, and the Cannabis Control Commission uh, was there because a lot of towns, like, how do they deal with, with those bylaws that they've never even seen before? So that was the support that Piner Valley Planning Commission was, was extending to them. Uh, there was a very interesting one on age-friendly uh, age designation, which I think uh, uh, Chris Brestrup uh, uh, took, and, but I think we have, a, well, we have a change of the guard there, but I, that, that was something that above and beyond the uh, handicap uh, or accessibility issue. It's more just signage and uh, facilitating uh, for the elderly in terms of navigating in town, having restrooms available, real simple things, but it's a designation like, why can't Amherst have it? I think Northampton uh, does. Uh, there's a presentation on a database they have, a fantastic database, and actually I made some notes. If you want statistics about Amherst versus other towns, <laughs> I thought this was interesting. Um, we, uh, Okay, I, I, I sent an email to the planning board on this, so that's why I don't mind uh, saying this. So our, our residential tax rate is the sixth highest within the Pioneer Valley, and the Pioneer Valley region is, is the two counties. Pioneer Valley is the three counties. So it includes Franklin County, so it's, that's 68 municipalities. Uh, our taxes have risen by 30% in 10 years, whereas Northampton, who has a, a lower tax rate, they rank 42nd but they, their tax rate has risen by 50% over the last 10 years, interesting. We have the third most uh, acreage of open space within the 60, um, 68 communities, uh, but on a percentage basis, we were, we're far and beyond. So you know, Amherst has done a great job in terms of open space. So we've got that covered. Um, we are one of only nine municipalities that uh, achieve 10% affordable housing within the Pioneer Valley. Uh, Leverett, Amherst, and Pelham have the highest medium value of owner-occupied housing. And behind Springfield and Holyoke, uh, Amherst has the third highest percentage of non-white residents at 28.2%. And Amherst Regional High School is in the bottom 14 of the 68 municipalities percentage-wise graduating from high school. So the graduation rate is 92.5%, which isn't so, so hot. Um, and again, with that database, which I, I love numbers, but um, it's kind of skewed because we have this huge stu student population. So a lot of things, you know, you look at it and it's like, oh, that's because we have, you know, so much of the the teen and early 20s. Um, but you know, that in, in a nutshell, those, that's some takeaways I've had um, in the recent meeting, yeah. I, I just want you all to think that, as Jack just pointed out, PVPC is a data collection. This is their driver. It's about uniting all these communities in the Pioneer Valley and then providing information so we can have initiatives to improve ourselves and improve the area. So they take, you know, they're a, like a quasi-government agency, so they, they drive on grants, so they get grants, so they have in-house projects that they're working on all the time, and, and we only have so much say on how they do that. But the other part to remember is they're sort of like a consultant that you can use, and that's how a lot of our personal interactions with Amherst have been. Um, like an example is um, uh, Jeff Kravitz was that economic uh, plan last year, right? So you know, they hired or they utilized PVPC as a consultant to help them create that report. 
So some of that is, you know, again, you'd have to go to your director of planning, Chris Vestrup, every year they must decide, well, what are we going to ask for? How are we going to try to use them? Um, you know, what do we, can we get for free? And what, you know, can we pay for, for more? So that's how to sort of, when you're, and I, again, I have to say, go to their website, everything from the posting of their um, public relations where they announce their reports, and they put everything up. So it's a huge resource. So I think sometimes in the issue of, you know, wanting to know, there's so much we could go on and on, like every time there's a meeting about all the things they're working on. But part of it is you're going to have certain issues that you're concerned about. Like the marijuana one was very big last year. And so PVPC was a huge resource in helping staff and, and select board, you know, stay abreast of that. So I think it's about learning how to use PVPC as a tool for yourselves individually, yourselves as a group, and again, as, a, as the TAP. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Is that a report that you did for the planning board that you were reading from, or? Uh, oh, no, I just, I think I sent an email uh, to Chris with, with just the high points, just kind of perusing through the database, wondering okay. where Amherst mm -hmm. stood on all these things. So okay. that is, uh, if you want to take a note, it's pioneervalleydata.org. Yeah. They launched it about four months ago. Right. That's why yeah. he brought it. It's just all Pioneer Valley data, no periods or anything there than dot org. Chris, did you have a comment on that? <laughs> so I just wanted to say that I do receive updates probably about once a month or quarterly or something like that from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. They have um, someone who is uh, tasked with communicating information about what they do. So I could, um, next time I receive one, uh, forward it to the town manager, and he could forward it to you. Would, would that be of interest that to you? That would be excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Andy, you had a question earlier. Could I just add one thing on Chris? Sure. And you can all sign up for their email newsletter. Right. That just, that anyone can do, and you'd get, it's only about once a month, and it gives you all the information. Okay. We'll make sure we provide you with the information for how to sign up for that. Andy. Yeah, this is maybe as much a comment to my colleagues on the council as to, uh, to um, who are here to speak with us, but a point was made earlier that we may need to think about, and that was that we've had ongoing discussions at various times about the value of turnover in positions and the value of maintaining stability and uh, what is gained by stability. And a point was made that uh, advancing into leadership positions on the Regional Planning Commission depends upon uh, the amount of time that people are in positions. And if we're creating a uh, system that deprives us ever of having seniority in these positions, that's a consequence, and it's a consequence that I think that we ought to be talking about. Alyssa? Um, I agree. I suggested, actually, that Jack mentioned that, because he would mentioned that to me personally, um, as being an ongoing part of our conversation. It's also true that We've had people serve on the planning board for a long time and still never been on the executive committee. So um, we, it, it, it didn't solve our problem in the past, but it is something we're, in terms of getting on the executive committee. When people had served 10 or 12 years on our planning board, they didn't necessarily get on, they didn't get on the executive committee, but that doesn't mean that it isn't something we should be, we should be taking track of. The other thing I did just want to make a small disclaimer to make it clear that actually Pioneer Valley Planning Commission was of very little use to us when it came to the marijuana bylaws. We were ahead of the game and it was actually Chris helping them. <laughs> so, and that's, that's often the case with us is that because of our planning staff being very forward thinking, we serve as a resource to them in many cases as well um, as them serving as a resource to us. But it's always good to know what different things they do make available to us, like the economic development series from last year. Sarah. 
I also thought it was interesting that it was brought up. And Steve originally had said that you know a lot of planning boards and zoning boards are elected. So it was interesting to me to find out that you know towns that are a little bit bigger or cities actually do that. So that's something I definitely would want to look into and see how they do that. So that's another interesting part. According to our charter, we appoint. So it would meet a charter change. But yes, Steve. Yeah. So counterintuitively, oftentimes it's the elected planning boards like Hadley that have people that serve for 20 years. You know, it's crazy. Right. I mean, um, so you'd think that'd be the other way around, that the elected planning boards would turn over more often, but it's actually the, the, the opposite. The other thing is, and now we're getting down into the weeds, the PVPC uses a nominating committee, and I, frankly, I don't like nominating committees because of the reasons that you're stating, that they have some sort of an imaginary list of qualifications for positions that actually are not way outside of what the bylaws state. And, you know, if there was one thing that go Amherst that we could push is to get rid of the nominating committee or to challenge the nominating committee run from the floor. But that's if you want to log the time in. Another option is to challenge the makeup of the executive committee so that it has to include people with younger tenure, with less tenure. So that you don't, they have to fill slots with people who might be not as experienced. Yes, George. I just want to come back to data for a second. Um, I sometimes feel like I'm trying to think of things or, or make decisions that I really don't have a clear sense of, you know, like a snapshot of our community. And I'm getting the feeling that this is actually a very valuable resource um, for getting a sense of, of, of a picture of the community at a given time. And I guess a question also for Chris, whether she finds that this is the main source of data for her or whether she has many other resources. Um, um, but where we get our data um, and how up to date it is so that we're making decisions, say, on issues about aging or housing, um, that we have numbers that, you know, we can rely on. Um, and so this is obviously an excellent source, uh, but I, I'm getting the feeling it's not the only source. Um, and I wonder if Chris has any, just a comment as to where else she goes. Um, and maybe that's a long, long answer, so she can just say no thanks. But. We do rely on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for some of our data, but we also have um, resources in our own department, people who are very good at doing research, and so um, we rely on our colleagues as well. Um, I think Amherst is kind of blessed with really good staff people, particularly in the planning department, so thank you. Okay. George. So what I dream of, and it may very well exist, and it's just, again, another example of my ignorance, but um, that we would have this sort of stuff that we could look at on a regular basis as we're making our decisions, the snapshot from year to year um, to the degree that it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking particularly of issues about aging, but also housing, um, mm -hmm. that there are numbers that we get updated and that we have actually, we get or are told where we can go to get them. Um, that's kind of what's in the back of my mind. And there does seem to be a basis for at least the start of that with the work that Jeff Kravitz has done. Mm -hmm. And just adding to that to the extent that, you know, we can pick up other databases as well. Are there additional comments? Qu yes, Dorothy. Um, well, one easy way to let us know what the PVPC is doing is um, on the, our um, email. There was a calendar that you'd put out. And I looked at it and I said, oh, this looks interesting. I tried to print it, it came out all funny. And the print was too small for me to read anyway. So if you had like an age-friendly calendar that you gave to us for the coming year, we would actually each month read something about what this group does. Um, and it would be an easy way of getting us more familiar with the group. Yeah, uh, Pat Beaudry, is, oh, his title is Director of, of Media, but he does more, he's outreach. And he offered to come, or if he was invited, he would mm -hmm. come. But uh, if we ask him, uh, I know we can get copies of the calendars in full, in their normal size, yeah. yeah, for for everyone. So uh, I can write a note. <laughs> <laughs> he would be thrilled. Okay. Uh, the, the, the calendars are a new approach because mm -hmm. I think when they normally do things, nobody really looks at it. It's just yeah. more boring black and white text. But so they, they jazz it up, and, and I think that's what people are doing now, kind of making it more interesting. So, but, and all the information is in there. So it's 
good. It had beautiful pictures. Pardon? Beautiful pictures. Yes, yes, the best of the valley. Are there other comments or questions at this time? Thank you for the update. We look forward to hearing from you periodically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the town manager has asked whether we would be willing to take 7C, which is the dog park public way request. And if I will, as president, make that change. Please come forward, Mr. Zomack. Good evening, and thank you for squeezing me in here. I will try to be brief. Um, I want to leave time for councilor questions. I'm here tonight um, really uh, to give a brief overview of the dog park project um, with a specific focus. Um, and I believe that the, this request will be referred tonight, but as keepers of the public way, uh, the town council has authority on any project that may have an impact on one of our roads or our streets, our public ways in town. And uh, tonight I just want to outline quickly um, one such project, which is the dog park. We have a modest request off of Old Belchertown Road uh, to add some parking, some paved parking and access for the proposed new dog park. Before you on the screen, I have a couple of quick slides and I just wanted to go through these and, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, uh, Oops, if I could stay with the first slide. Thank you very much, Athena. So um, for over a year now, the Dog Park Task Force, uh, chaired by Jim Pistrang uh, and uh, with the vice chair of Dr. Ted Diamond, a local vet, has been working uh, closely, I've been working closely with them to identify a place for a dog park and uh, try to search for funding for that dog park. And I'm happy to say that uh, we have both. We have a, a, an excellent location and we've put together a funding package um, where most of the funding for the dog park is coming from a private foundation called the Stanton Foundation. After searching high and low all over town, we uh, determined that the best location for the dog park was at the old capped landfill off of Old Belchertown Road, uh, indicated by the large, uh, overly large uh, red dot there on Old Belchertown Road. Uh, we are not going to build a dog park in the water. Um, it will be on the west side of Old Belchertown Road. Um, uh, the, the landfill, the old landfill, is about 55 acres. Just to give you a scale, we're talking about one and a half acres. This is a very modest park. The um, uh, dog park task force uh, started out their efforts really saying they did not want the Cadillac of dog park. They want something functional. Uh, they want something simple and they wanted something fairly inexpensive. They did not want to break the bank on this project and I appreciated all of that, uh, uh, that direction. So we found this site. We've been working through various processes. We, to date, we have been through the Conservation Commission, the Design Review Board, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, the Planning Board, and we're working with the Natural Heritage um, an endangered species program because there's endangered species on the landfill and we're working with the DEP because this is a uh, capped landfill. Um, the funding for this, as I said, is coming from the Stanton Foundation, a wonderful foundation out of Boston. They have funded the design and they'll fund most of the construction of the dog park. Town meeting, as some of you may recall, also voted uh, to authorize some uh, modest use of CPA funds for this project. So we think we have a pretty good funding package. The Dog Park Task Force is now working on private funding to supplement some of their work. They're also looking for donations and everything from boulders to entryway kiosks. And they've already gotten some people to donate uh, substantial things to the project. So our site is Old Farm Road, Old Belchertown Road. And if we could squeeze that a little. Um, our design firm uh, is, um, Berkshire Design out of Northampton. And as you can see, this is a conceptual design uh, that is the basis for our um, uh, bidding documents. As I said, it's a, it's a one and a half acre site. It will be fully fenced for the safety of the users as well as the dogs. 
It'll be broken up into two areas, uh, one on, on one side, because I always get this messed up as to what you're looking at and what I'm looking at. Um, so on the larger side, uh, on the, on the um, south side will be for large dogs. Uh, again, a very simple design. Uh, everything has to be ADA, so there'll be an area of pea stone in the middle of the walkways. You can see the walkways. Um, let's see if I can use this. Well, in any event, for the sake of time, I think the walkways are clear. The multicolored structures are um, shade structures uh, on both sides. So they really mirror each other. One is for small dogs and smaller. On the other side is for larger dogs. The Dog Park Task Force is coming up with rules and regulations. Uh, they're going to form a friends group to support the dog park and also um, work toward uh, kind of monitoring the park for behavior-based um, uh, things, uh, as well as to raise money in the future. Um, again, a simple design, shade structures, walkways, some digging areas for dogs, uh, some sandy areas for dogs to dig. The specifics of the design are that we have to be very careful of the cap of the landfill. So we actually have to bring in a fair amount of fill to put on top of the landfill cap because we don't want dogs, people, or any of the vertical structures, which are few here, but to pierce the cap of the landfill. The other um, uh, fortunate thing we have is that this part of the landfill, uh, there's actually no trash under this portion of the landfill. It's actually where the stump dump was. So basically all organic material went in this area, not uh, refuse. Um, so again, simple design, Old Belchertown Road. If we can go to the next slide, and we might jump back. Uh, here are some of the simple features. We'll be looking at dog watering stations, trash receptacles, recycling receptacles, benches, welcoming kiosks. The shade structures will be very similar to what are at Mill River Park. Uh, they're, they're flies, really. They're in the upper center uh, picture. They'll be seasonal, so uh, we'll, we'll install them in the spring, provide shade for people and dogs throughout the year, and then take them down. And then there'll be a simple structure for maintenance equipment to be uh, stored on site. So not a lot of vertical, um, uh, not a lot of vertical um, construction in this project. Next slide. If we could enlarge, the second one would be more helpful. Thank you. And these were, uh, this, these two slides were in your packet. Um, essentially, uh, what we're asking for tonight and, and uh, hopefully in your referral uh, will be um, to construct what you can see. The red line is the public way associated with Old Belchertown Road. And what we'd like to construct in the public way are portions of, there'll be 22 parking spaces for visitors. Two of those will be um, for handicap uh, spaces. Um, and uh, all vertical structures will be constructed out of the public way on the parcel, um, but we're asking for permission for use of the public way for uh, nose-in parking. I've been working with Guilford Mooring, our superintendent of public works, and his staff and they've been reviewing the plans as we've gone along. Um, so I think I'll stop there, take questions, and we'll see where, where we go from there. Questions at this time? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I have two. Uh, one is a suggestion and one is a question. Um, I would suggest that there be a porta potty uh, there um, as part of it being a, a friendly spot for owners as well as dogs. Um, and I'm just wondering the, uh, I don't have a dog, but I, I, was, I read somewhere that they are very hard on um, land and turf so that there has to be, just as on the athletic fields, there has to be updating of it. And is, is that something that the friends are gonna take care of or is that, um, how is that gonna be dealt with? So that's a great question. Um, so the area inside the two loops will be a pea stone and there's been a long debate about this, and we're fortunate to have a number of people on the dog park task force, as well as our designer, Berkshire Design. They have done many dog parks, and they suggested two uh, surfaces. One is a pea stone in the center of each one of the uh, walkways, 
And then on the outside will just be natural turf. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to do a couple of things. One is when the turf wears out, and it does wear out from time to time, you can actually fence off the P-stone area mm -hmm. and let the turf regenerate. You can also flip that and open the turf and water down. Essentially, you do need to, from time to time, um, de -water, water the P-stone to just clear it out. And it'll just filter down through the P-stone into the, um, essentially, into the old landfill. So we're definitely taking that into consideration. We looked at artificial surfaces. Many dog parks have them around the country. They're incredibly expensive to put in. And we, the dog park task force said, no. They want it to go natural and less expensive. The porta potty issue, I think, is something we're going to have to look at. We did not design in a restroom, as you can see. Uh, the typical visit to a dog park is 45 minutes um, for dog and dog owner. So we're going to have to see whether porta potties are really necessary or not. It's not something, obviously, it would have added considerable cost if we had included a bathroom, a restroom out here. And you asked. You asked specifically about whether the friends would be taking responsibility for the upkeep. It'll be a combination, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with Mr. Mooring and um, Alan Snow, our director of Trees and Parks. There certainly will be some uh, responsibility for DPW, as well as some responsibility for our animal welfare officer, Carol Hepburn. Uh, Carol has been part of the planning for this uh, all along, is hugely supportive of it. And in all likelihood, she will be um, um, uh, brought in uh, as part of the um, uh, emptying uh, dog waste receptacles. The, the task force is also looking at composting those. Many communities like Cambridge actually have worked pretty actively to compost the dog waste. It's a little more complicated than it might seem, but we're looking at that in the future. So composting dog waste. Um, but certainly uh, removing the dog waste as it accumulates in the receptacles. Additional questions? Shalini. So um, uh, my understanding is the nonprofit and the friends are paying for this. What is the cost to the town? Um, Thank you. The only town funding, there certainly is staff support. Um, I work on this. Uh, Nate Malloy has been uh, assisting me in recent months. Um, the Stanton Foundation will contribute on the order of about $250,000 toward this park. Um, town meeting authorized $90,000, and the rest will be made up through private fundraising. And this is a, I will tell you, this is a modest, this will be between three dollars and $400,000 to construct, which is actually a very inexpensive dog park for Massachusetts. Sarah. So I'm just wondering, because of there is obviously maintenance, and it's, if it's an acre, I'm assuming some mowing, unless the dogs like absolutely like tromp through so much that they're mowing themselves. Do you know approximately how much a town will pay a year just for um, mowing and turf upkeep? And um, you know, I'm a, some at some point, you know, um, the shade cloths will have to be like redone. Do you? Did you guys have any like just? ballpark idea how much we pay a year? We haven't really ballparked the annual maintenance. Um, I will say in terms of the, the built structures, the Stanton Foundation is incredibly supportive of the initial construction, and then they allow you to do five-year incremental um, improvement. Uh, so if you need a replacement shade structure, Stanton can pay for it. If something breaks, if you want to add something to your dog park, you can reapply to Stanton. So once you're into, in, in the Stanton approved project list, you can go back to them for incremental uh, improvements. But I think um, mowing, again, this is not going to be need to be mowed like a, an athletic field, if you will. It's going to be more natural and can be mowed um, by uh, a different kind of mower, more uh, uh, more in line with what we use on conservation trails or something like that. So this will not be closely mown grass like at Plum Brook or Community Field. Um, so it'll be a, a rough surface, perfect for dogs and, and play, dog play. Um, I believe, Steve, you're next. Yeah, so Bill Kazin's not here, unfortunately, but um, you haven't lived until you've seen the St. Louis University Dog Park and Sculpture Park, which is a combination of those two 
those two uses, art park and, and, and dog park. And I mention this in part because, well, if the percent for art bylaw were law, then this would presumably be, um, some part of this would presumably be affected by that. But I think we can, I hope we can have more fun with some of the structures than, than the examples that were shown, which seem to be sort of off the shelf sheds. But I think that uh, this being a, you know, a town facility, you, you know, I think we can do, you know, have some more fun. We're, we're all, all open to fun, yeah, as long as it stays within the budget. Shalini. So, with, I mean, this is n not uh, taking away from the dog park, and I have, I love pets, but, and would putting money here be taking away from the town putting up something for homeless people, as we've been all part of the conversations of where do we put some of the homeless people who have been living on private properties. So the funding, the town time that we're putting, investing in this, would this in any way be taking away from that? I don't really think it's taking away from that, uh, nor is it taking funds away. The CPA dollars that were allocated toward this project are in the open space category. Um, so it really can't be used for other purposes. So um, these were these were voted, I'm going to say, two years ago in town meeting. Um, so, um, and again, 225, uh, I think to 250,000 is coming from the Stanton Foundation. So, um, I will say again, we responded to a need, the, the need that was articulated to us by dozens and dozens of residents was, we would like a dog park like many other communities in Massachusetts. So uh, Jim Pistrang and others for years were approaching the town saying, can we form a group? Can we get it together? Can, can we organize around this topic? Um, when Mr. Bockelman joined us, Jim was right there early on and said, I'd really like to, he'd really like to spearhead this effort. And that's when we put together the task force. So for over a year and a half, they've sought the funding, they've helped write the grants, and they've put this package together. Um, I think in the end, it will have modest upkeep requirements, but nothing near a playing field or something like that. Are there additional questions at this time? So the reason this comes before the council at this point is because it needs to be referred to CRC and David will be there since he's the liaison to CRC. Um, and so are there council questions regarding that? I think we've determined this is not an issue that needs to be taken up by finance because at this time it's not a financial request. It's a public way request. Yes. Pat. You know, I was just um, thinking about $90,000. Um, and that feels like a, not compared to 250000 but it's still a lot of money for the town right now. And so I'm having questions about um, the value of the project, the, to be honest. Just state and I have the, a dog. That money was previously voted by know, a previous legislative know. body. I know, but. I don't think we have the power to rescind that. And I will say, again, just. Actually, a good portion of that money is already committed to the environmental studies. We've done a notice of intent or um, wetlands permitting. We have to do what's called a PCUP, which is a post-closure use permit for any portion of the landfill. So we'll actually be studying to make sure that the landfill um, methane or any CO2 gases coming off the landfill are safe for dogs and people. We believe they are. We've had extensive discussions with DEP but that's all part of the process and all being paid for with these funds, so. Um, that were previously committed yeah. by a former legislative body of the town. And, Our, and I realize I haven't spoken specifically about the right of way, but I assume that that would be what I would go into with the CRC and then come back to you with a specific recommendation in terms of number of feet and getting into that, those kinds of details. Yes. Pat. 
scratching. Okay. Other questions? Steve. Anticipating referral to the CRC, the jurisdiction then, or the reason for that is the right of way. Yes. As opposed to the design. Exactly. Yeah. It is because when we, as we pass the, our own rules about what needs to be uh, looked at by the council when it's permanent right of way, it has to be looked at and voted on. And this is an easement on the permanent right of way. Okay, additional questions. So the Would, motion, I'm sorry. If I could just go, it actually wouldn't be an easement I'm since sorry. it's a town project. It, right. it is simply the, a permanent use Change. of the right of right. way. Yeah. So the town doesn't seek an easement on itself. Thank you. It would be permanent Thanks. use of the right of way. In fact, the way the motion reads is to refer re the requested permanent changes to the public way at 95 Old Beltertown Road to the Community Resource Committee and report back to the Town Council on August 15th, 2019. Okay, so it's a motion to refer. Are there further questions before we move to the motion? All right, then is there a motion? And the motion is to refer the requested permanent changes to the public way at 95 Old Beltertown Road to the Community Resource Committee with a report back to the Council on August 15, 2019. Dorothy. I move that we do that. And second. George. I second. Any further questions, comments? Then all those in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And opposed? Abstain? Okay. Great, thank you very thank much. Thank you. So it's 11 4, 0 against, 0 abstain, and 2 absent. Okay. Uh, yes, let's take a break. We will take a break till 8 o'clock. Thank you.
going to be reconvening momentarily. Keeping us moving along, Mr. Bosserman. So thank you. Um, I've given you a 15 page mm -hmm. self assessment or response to the goals that were set by the select board last year. So first, I want to start by uh, thanking you for allowing me to serve the town, and this is a dream job for me. I really love my work and I love working for the town. It's a real privilege. Um, so this is sort of a thing where like when you're in the middle of a project or something and um, you're, you're sort of straightening them up a mess over here and you're sort of putting out a fire over here and you're pushing somebody ahead of you and you're pulling somebody behind you, sometimes you forget to look up. And so this uh, process allows us the time to sort of stick our head up and look and see how we're doing. And I think we're really doing well. If you look back where we were a year ago and what we've accomplished in the last year, it's really remarkable what the town, the council, the staff, the appointed boards, um, people who have been coming to your meetings and talking to you on a regular basis, how far we've gone as a town to change our form of government. Um, so this, I, I, when we think back, you know, we, we've used a lot of uh, analogies like building the plane while we fly, changing the tire while we drive. Um, so I, I sort of always think of it as, as um, building, building the government um, from scratch. And that's what we did. And I, there were no plans that came with the, the toolkit that we had. And we, we were just sort of did it ourselves. And I think that it really looks good. I think it's being responsive to the people. I think it reflects the values that um, the people in the community were hoping for when, they, when the uh, charter was written and when it, when it passed. Um, so I think that this, the, the um, part of this was because I think that the, the select board did guide the transition in the first place. They were looking forward. I think that uh, the council, the town council came together, people who didn't really know each other and sort of talked to each other and worked out differences and continue to work out differences. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's messy. Um, and then the town staff, every time that we've asked them to do something, they came and did it. And I sort of look at this room as being emblematic of that, that again, I've told the story where, um, you know, we were about to contract this out and town staff said, can we design and build it? And every time I'm in here for a meeting, I really appreciate, you know, the, it's not fancy, but it's, it's very attractive, it's very handsome, and it works really well. And that's sort of how I feel that we've built this government. It's not fancy, but it, it works really well. And so I credit the town staff who've stepped up to do this. So the review provides me um, the assessment of how we're doing. Um, what, how we're doing, it's not perfect. We have more work to do. Um, but I, I am really proud of what we've done. So the 15-page report that you have basically just tracks the goals that were established by the select board. And that's the purpose of that. The select board separated the goals into two sections, short-term goals for the, for the select board prior to their uh, demise, and, and mid- and long-term goals that the select board recommended to the town council. There are 10 categories, 24 short-term goals, and 60 long-term goals. Um, and reviewing the goals last year, one select board member said, we are something to behold. Um, and admiring, not, maybe not admiring, but saying, wow, this is quite a document. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about what I wrote because I think the document speaks for itself. Uh, I wanna focus on the bigger picture, um, and I'm not gonna take a ton of your time because I know there's a lot of other things on tonight. Um, so first off, I, wanna, I want people to understand the scope of our operation. We're a large operation. We're $85 million budget. There are 250 town employees and a similar number in the Amherst Public Schools. And um, I want to cover six, I think six big topics. So that we, things that we can look back as accomplishments or things. And there's, I don't have slideshows or anything like that, so you just have to listen to me. Um, <laughs> 
so the change in government. So we talk about this one way or another every day, every week. There, there was no roadmap. Um, and I think I worked hard to make the transition successful. Uh, this room I mentioned was, was very symbolic of it. So some of the things that we did to try to make it successful were, were the uh, meet the candidates, where it's the first time I met many of you that in July of last year, uh, where we brought department heads to come and talk to candidates because I thought it was really important for any candidate who had, who had a, achieved a spot on the ballot felt comfortable that they had a baseline knowledge of gov local government. Uh, because you have incumbents in other roles, people who'd served on other committees. Um, but it, and also to sort of say, we're all starting at the same level. And if you want more information, please talk to me. Um, before, uh, after, the, after the election, um, and then I also offered to meet with any, in, any, any candidates as well. There were two post-election meetings that we had after the election, but before you were sworn in, um, with, where we talk, talked about uh, open government, public records, conflict of interest. We had excellent trainers there to help us. Um, and to do some team building things with Stan Rosenberg and others. Um, I think the inauguration was thoughtfully planned and recognized the importance of the transition and we did it the Amherst way. Um, we, the council had a retreat uh, early on to help where you sort of came together and started talking about what your, your values and goals were. Uh, we brought in departments on a regular basis and you committed at the time um, throughout January and February to learn more about each individual department. Our departments really valued that. They worked hard to prepare their presentations. They were excited to be able to get in front of you. And I appreciate that you all devoted time to come in so they could have that opportunity. Um, we developed procedures for reviewing and improving appointments. Um, we started a lot of new committees, the ECAC, Ranked Choice Voting, License Commission, all the council committees. These are all new committees that normally in a year, if you started a committee, that would be an accomplishment. This group in the town started a whole bunch all at once. Um, so that's the change in government. That's one sort of thing that I want to hit on. The second one is fiscal management. We are in a strong financial position and we're getting stronger with new growth and new sources of revenue and with cost containment. Uh, this is going against strong headwinds uh, with entities that don't pay taxes to us and, and place demand on town services, and it's more and more all the time. Um, how have we done this? Uh, we've contained costs with um, I want to focus on health insurance, which is uh, up to 10% of our budget at times. Um, this happened a year ago, but was continued into this year. Uh, we I, I identified the problem. We noted that the increases in health insurance through the health trust was not sustainable, that the increases that were going to be necessary was going to break the back of our employees and of the town and the school, the town of Pelham and the library. Um, we, we mapped out a path to go forward. We worked, worked with our union partners and, implement, and implemented a significant change where we went from a self-insured program to a fully insured program. And then we implemented over time with dozens of meetings with employees at all of our different locations. We got there and it paid off. Um, we have a stable insurance that's fully insured. Uh, this year we had a 0.6%, that's less than 1% increase in health insurance, which really stabilized the schools and the town's budget. Um, and we paid off the surcharge, which we had to carry over because we were, the, the health trust was in debt. We had to carry that over into, the, into this fiscal year, and we paid that off early uh, as, as, as we got more revenue coming in from Blue Cross and from Harvard. So, so we had the change in government, we have fiscal management, we're strong, and we also, uh, the other thing on the fiscal management is new revenue. Uh, new revenue comes from uh, marijuana money that is starting to come in, from uh, new taxes on the Airbnb um, uh, short-term rentals, and then new growth that's being developed throughout the town. All those new buildings you see going up bring in new revenue to the town. The third category is people. Um, this town runs well because of the town staff who are so dedicated and professional. Um, our working for the town is, is a real opportunity that people work, hope to get to in their careers and we're the envy of other communities. Um, we have um, 
given our talented people more tasks. We haven't add a lot of, added a lot of new bodies. We've asked people to do more. For instance, our, the finance director at the school department is now our capital's projects manager. He has done a superb job with the finance committee and meets tomorrow afternoon to, pr to present a, the new tool for an analyzing how we can afford the four projects. So this is a talented uh, staff member who's taken on additional roles. Uh, our facilities manager at the Jones Library um, has taken on the additional role of being facilities manager for all town buildings. Again, uh, someone who was looking for growth in his, in his job and, and saw it on our side and, and it was a win-win situation because we did not have to fill that position. Uh, the economic development director has taken on a lot of new things. He, he's been our marijuana czar, he's been our bylaws czar, um, he's our parking czar at this point and he still does all of his economic development work as well. Um, we've done some, we've, um, we've eliminated one position, but that person did not lose the job. They, they got transferred when we brought the, the uh, billing for ambulances in-house, and that increased our ability to bill more comprehensively and kept, keep our billing up to date. Uh, we did it, so we have one less person, but that individual was able to fill a, a job that had been vacant in another department. Um, we, were, we were successful for a while when we had the town clerk also serve the role of clerk of the council and we were really fortunate that um, Margaret was there to do that and I think what we learned is that uh, that was an unusual situation and I think wisely uh, the council and we realized that they are two jobs. Uh, I, sometimes you know unless you have a, a unique person to do it you have to recognize when it's not going to work out that's too much for one person and I think there was nobody that had Margaret's town management, management experience and town clerk experience that was, we didn't, was gonna walk through that door. So may, having that separated, I think was, uh, um, having it together was a good decision. When she left, it made good sense to separate. So we need to know when, when these cost savings are good and when they're not. Um, the comptroller is serving as our finance director. Um, we've promoted uh, one of our key IT staff to be the communications manager because we know we've wanted to increase that capability. Um, the building commissioner has taken on additional capital management, actual um, uh, project management of some of our town buildings. Um, the, the assistant town manager does a dozen different things that you, know, you probably never even see, but he does a million things all the time. Um, and our superintendent of public works has also fills the role of, of managing many of our larger capital projects. And then I think the biggest success for us is our uh, community participation officers. I'm really proud of that decision and that you supported um, to, instead of picking one person that we were hiring, to locate this with three talented uh, women who were willing to and excited about taking on the task, um, brought all different kinds of skills to the project and I think just have really rocked the whole CPO thing and they have a million more ideas that they, um, are eager to get moving on. Um, and then finally, I think we, we were really fortunate to have a lot of people step up uh, and volunteer to be, serve on committees. So many people in their interviews would say to us, um, I was excited by the change of government and I put my name in and I, was, I wanted to be part of the change. And it was really exciting and so we, we filled, you know, we worked with the Residents Advisory Committee and the CPOs to recruit, interview, and appoint dozens of board and committee members. So fiscal management, change of government, people, and then communications. The, um, one of the things that has been really, we talked a lot about is that communicating is a really important task that local governments usually aren't very good at and we need to get better at it as well. We, and I think you being out there in the fields are telling us more you can bit, get better at some of the things that we do to communicate. We do some good, we do some stuff and it's really good. You know, I do the town manager reports, but it doesn't get wide enough distribution. We share it with department heads and some people share it with their constituents, but we can take that and make that into a more usable document for the public. Uh, the Cup of Joes are pretty popular. I intend to keep doing those. Um, you know, we get a, you know, a dozen people at every one and it's, it's, it's people like it. Even if they don't show up, people tell me, I really like that you do that. And I said, well, you've never come. And they said, I know, but I like that you do it. I said, okay. Um, the meet up with the manager, we were five uh, random employees from the town come and meet with me. We had one this morning at DPW. They choose, uh, HR just 
gets five people from five different departments and they tell me what they think. And I learned a lot of things about um, someone who's been here three months but who felt like we weren't really onboarding them, aren't training them well. That, and it really hit me that we um, hire someone and then the person, there's somebody there who has to train them, but we don't train them how to train. Um, and then this person was feeling that she felt resentment that she didn't know her job because no one trained her. And it was just really instructive to me. And we had a police officer there who would talk about what they go through to train before they're allowed to go out. And it was really instructive when she started to, to describe the process of not just the academy, but they spend a year with a mentor in the department who they check in with. And then they go to another person for another year. And then they go back to their original mentor to sort of circle back. It's a really um, amazing kind of process that the police department follows. And um, it's something that other departments really admire about our department because they know that we really invest a lot of time and effort into this. Um, you know, we do press releases. The other thing I'm really proud of is the efforts that the LSSE has done to take their, pro um, their programs into neighborhoods, uh, something that you know, I encourage them to do and that they actually won a, a, an award for recognition for doing it the way they've been doing it. We had the um, cleanup day, which was a modest success. We, we learned a lot from what worked and what didn't work, but I think it'll be a lot better. We intend to do it at least once a year. CPOs are thinking twice a year. I'm not so sure about that, but um, they're excited about maybe engaging the college community when they come back as being a way to invest in the community as soon as they get on, on campus. Um, and then again, the CPOs, I think, have done a spectacular job of reaching into the community, showing up at district meetings, all those things. So the communication piece is, is working. Um, so there are um, the big projects after fiscal management are capital projects. Um, roads and sidewalks, we talk about a lot. We're putting more money into those. Uh, the capital plan, you'll hear more about in the coming weeks. The finance committee will get a view of the tool. This capital plan is going to be really important in the fall. It's one of the big projects that I think the council is going to grapple with. Can we afford these four projects? Um, are, we, are we able to move forward on them? Are you going to be willing to appropriate money to do schematic designs of several of the projects? Uh, the library is now number two on the waiting list. The school will know on December 11th, um, I think it's December 11th, if they get funding well, or not. Um, so all these things are, are uh, teed up, and that's something that the, the town, is, the council, is going to have to start to grapple with and establish where your values are and which ones you want to have go for a debt exclusion, which ones you don't want to have go to a debt exclusion, which ones, how expensive, how much money do you want to spend on them? Those are all variables that you'll be able to play with in this tool and you're going to want to hear from the public on what, what where the values are. The, the decisions you make will be the values of the town. So it's, it's a really important decision that you're going to be facing. Um, so I think we've had successful relations with um, our, our institutional partners as much as I wish they paid us more. Um, we've had a lot of challenges with them. Hampshire College went through two leadership changes, three leadership changes now, as of August 6th, so a third president. Um, and uh, that's been a challenge because it made it really hard to communicate with them when we were looking for land or whatever it is we were trying to do. Um, they were unable uh, to make substantive decisions because they were just struggling with their own existence. So that was a time-consuming challenge that involved a lot of people as we started to work about the, um, what their future was, and that's why the Commissioner of Higher Education will be here on Friday to hear more about what was the impact on our town, because it did have an impact on our town and on the college, and what does that mean. Um, successfully worked with Amherst College to secure a significant piece of land that could serve as a DPW. We're in that sort of exploratory phase now, and that's what they've given us permission to do, to explore. Um, the council has had multiple meetings, and I'm proud of the process we're using, actually, where we did door to door. We did a, a neighborhood meeting just outside under a tent. We have two community meetings, and then after tomorrow night's meeting, we will sit back and the council and others will say, okay, what information did we glean from this? Because we are getting good information from this process and what people's concerns are and where um, 
what, what are the challenges to this particular site. Any place you put a DPW, or like a lot of things, there will be neighborhood opposition, no matter where it is, unless it's in the middle of an industrial area, and we don't have any of those. So we have to be prepared for that, but we also have to not be blinded by we, we're moving forward on this no matter what. So it's an important process that we're engaged in, and I want it to be, make sure that it's really an authentic and genuine process. And I think that's the way the council is approaching it, is that we haven't made up our mind. We, this is a really unique opportunity that's been offered to the town, but we need to hear from what people think. Um, we've had, um, you know, we've had some other capital investments that are really good. Mill Street Bridge is open good. Uh, Station Road Bridge is open, and some people love it and don't want it to change from what it is right now because they like the sort of quaintness of it. Um, um, we have things that are on the docket, like the North Amherst intersection and the future of the North Amherst uh, area, the, the library, the Jones Library, the North Amherst Library, and of course the schools. So those are our big sort of categories of things that we've accomplished this year, which I think is a lot, you know, at, we got two bridges open. <laughs> it's kind of like, wow, uh, we bought one. Um, so what's coming up, and I think this is kind of the more interesting piece, is what, what do we see, and this will be in conversation with you as you go through your retreat, to say what are the things that you as a council are going to prioritize for the town. Um, the capital plan, the capital program that we want to do, what are, the, are you going to be, what are your values, your values will be reflected in what you decide about the capital plan. And so that's a really important, big discussion that the entire community is going to be care a lot about. Um, uh, we want to, um, as part of that, we want to educate you about the costs of all these things because you need to see what the impacts of your decisions are. We want to educate you about roads and sidewalks because I think there's work to be done to understand um, you just don't go out and pave a road. It's a very complex decision-making process, and I think that we'd like the opportunity to talk to you about that. Um, as we do more development in town, and it's, it's you know, uh, Chris Brestrup earlier today was talking, saying that she's been here and there was like, it's kind of really quiet for about 10 years. There wasn't a lot of development and suddenly they're slammed. There's development going after development. And what's, and she said we were in good shape because those 10 years they had done a lot of planning to prepare for the development, what they wanted and things like that. But now these actual developments, each one brings a whole set of, of issues with it and they're bumping up against neighbors. And so when you do development, you have neighborhood issues and that's all stuff that the staff has to, has to grapple with. Um, we have a lot of other issues coming up. Anything to do with North Amherst because development is heavy up there and we need to be paying attention to what the Beacon Project is gonna have, the impact is that is gonna have on the, on the neighborhood. Um, the census is really important to us because that matters a lot in terms of where we are federally in terms of money that comes to the town. And we have a population that has a high likelihood of not participating as fully as they should. So we need to be in front of that issue. Uh, Craig Stores, you've heard about the issues with Craig Stores, important cultural facility for us. Um, not sure exactly what is going to happen with that, but the town will be fully engaged in that, the future of that. Um, the Valley CDC project on Northampton Road, again, something that's really important to the community. I think we've did a, a bit of it we've, um, in terms of engaging, but there's a long way to go for that project and a long, a lot of conversations to be had through permitting and funding. Um, the East Street School, um, uh, marijuana, there's a whole world of, that still has to be addressed of uh, regulations and permits and agreements that we have to reach with marijuana. Um, and then lastly, one of the things we're working on prospectively is um, preparing for when we do borrow money, um, we're, we'll be seeking a bond uh, rating. So we're trying to put all the pieces in place to make sure that when we go for our bond rating, we've got everything that they're gonna look at ready, standardized, uh, examinable, and we're ready to move forward. So that's not really um, exactly my self-assessment, but it's sort of where we are as a town in a way. And, um, uh, actually, the 15-page document is sort of is what um, speaks for itself, and I welcome comments that you're going to have as you, after you have a chance to read that. And I encourage you to talk to other people. I encourage you to talk to any employee or anybody so you get a full um, uh, assessment of, of how I'm doing in my job and how the town is doing in its job. 
Thank you. So let me just say that this is a time to ask clarifying questions. It's not a time to get into the valuative statements. Um, that obviously will come as we go with, get into the month of August. Um, in the packet, there was a re slightly revised, and I'll point out the revision in a moment, the calendar for the evaluation of the town manager. Uh, the report that you received from the town manager, his performance goals and his assessment, self-assessment is meeting one of those goals. Um, the other, let me just quickly find it for you. Um, while we were able to get some of the material out to you by Monday, which was the Monday after the um, deadline to receive comments from the public, comments from committee chairs and members, and comments from staff, I did send you some ind individual uh, summaries of each of those in separate emails. I just want to remind you that those are not public documents. Uh, the only documents that will be public from the town manager's evaluation are in fact the ones where we each do our evaluation and then the summative document that we then work with and come forward with. Um, so the only change was it, it took us till, took me till Thursday to get you the summative documents. Uh, but say, having said that, are there any other uh, clarifying questions with regard to the performance report at this time. Yes, Dorothy. Um, when you were talking about the multitasking of the town staff, and I, I thought of it looking at it two ways. One, it's you know great leadership to do that, and I looked at it from the point of view of the worker, and I was feeling um, wondering if there was any unhappiness or burnout, but you used a phrase there, somebody looking for career advancement. So I'm wondering, did you pay, when people take on part of another job, did they get ad addition to their pay? Yes, yes. Okay. And sometimes it's, they don't typically do it for the pay, but we feel it's important to recognize the additional responsibilities they take on. Um, a lot of people want the new challenge or the new, and. And sometimes they like to take it on because it might not be permanent. And that's one of the, the things, that they want to try it and see if it's something that they really like doing or not. And that's been a, a benefit to us. And there are some employees that we know that if, they don't, if they're not challenged, they start looking around. Mm -hmm. that they don't like doing the same thing all over and over, and they're looking for new challenges. Alyssa? I want to rewind the tape a little bit to go back to something that I think reflects incredibly well on your generous spirit of personality, but kind of practically speaking, kind of maybe not what you actually wanted to encourage us to do. Because I believe you indicated that you encouraged us to talk to any employee about how you're doing in your job, <laughs> which was a really nice thing for you to say, but I would really strongly discourage this council from doing that. We got input from employees who chose to participate, which as you've seen in past reports is always a small number. And of course, if you see somebody at the farmer's market and they want to tell you how awesome the town manager is, that's awesome. But I am quite certain you do not want us calling up your employees and asking no. them to meet with us about your performance. So let, we'll take that in the spirit in which it was offered, but we will not follow up on that practically speaking. I want to thank Alyssa for that clarifying that yes. generous but inappropriate comment. <laughs> you could mark down now. I also just want to point out that, um, and I've said this to you, you did not, you received some comments. They are hardly even a representative sample, and it's something we will wrestle with as we decide what to do with those comments. Okay? Any other questions or comments at this time? Yes, Shalini. Could I just get a sense of how many employees do we have? Because we received 30, and is that, as Alyssa just alluded to, that is, that's typical that we just received 30? I think as of today, we have 257 full-time employees. Oh. Thank you. And on, that the, includes, on the town side, does not include the schools. And the schools are how many more? 280 for the town. Okay, the municipal. thank you, because we did receive some uh, I think we received committee. Yeah, go ahead. 259, 200. 
80 schools. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth. Quick follow up on that. So, and, and in the past, not necessarily now, but in the past, we would always have at the end of the old evaluations, which you can find online, statistically how many pe employees we had at any given, because we have fewer employees now than we have had at other points in the past. So, um, but would show you that that yield's pretty small. Just to follow up on something, I noticed that the, I know our president is very um, focused on what's a representative sample and what isn't. <laughs> this is something that's really important to her because of her other careers, and I appreciate that, but I wanna make clear that it's my, to make sure I'm clear on my understanding of the process, which is that we are all taking those into account given that we understand they are a very small sample. I am not in any way expecting the president to mention anything about them other than to say, we heard from a few people about this, that, or the other thing, not, we don't want to you know, make it seem like it wasn't worth them turning it in given that a bunch of other people didn't bother, but we do, rep we do understand. Mm -hmm. This is not like a survey survey by a professional firm that right. got us real answers, but we're all thinking about those answers as we're filling out our report, but there would be relatively little about it as has been done in the past in the final summary document because there's just very little there. And the same is true for the public. Yes. We say, we used to even say, town meeting members, please write to us, and like almost no one ever writes to right. us. Shalini. Follow, follow up on that. It sounds like this has been the case every year, and then have you looked at what are the reasons why employees don't participate, and how can we remove the hurdles and get more it, representation? Let, let me just say that um, we even tried this year by using SurveyMonkey, where they could do it online and anonymously, hoping that it would encourage an increase in response, and it did not. You could also turn it in paper-wise. Andy. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, this has been a long-standing challenge for select boards, uh, and having been on the select board that actually evaluated more than our current town manager, I, uh, who's involved in other evaluations of another town manager. But this is an ongoing issue that we each year try and find a different way to address it, and we will again next year. Exactly. Pat. Um, I just wanted to say about public um, responses, uh, I'm being stopped in a variety of different situations to, um, where uh, residents are talking to me about you, um, and I find that very invigorating and very supportive of your work. Um, and I know diversity is something that we are, as a town, and you are struggling with, um, but that it's recognized by many of the people in town, those efforts. Thank you. We'll have opportunity for addition, additional evaluative comments later. That's okay. It's very easy to move on. Are there additional comments or questions at this time? Yes, Paul. So in response to a question, I think I spoke too globally. Not every, when someone takes on a new task, it doesn't mean they get more money. It, if someone's taking on a new significant responsibility, but for instance, the economic development director, if he suddenly is doing some more tasks, that doesn't mean his pay changes. Right. Uh, so there, there, it depends on what it is. If, so it, it, it's but for not, example, the person who added a custodial responsibility, he did. Right. Okay. Right. So it's, it, it's not just, I, I felt like, oh, people might think, oh, every time somebody takes on something new, they get more money. It's not the case. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Shalini? Um, I just want to acknowledge, uh, I know we're not going into substantive stuff, but I just want to acknowledge how every person I've employee I've interacted with, including yourself, has been so responsive. And, and at the same time, I want to say that because you've been so responsive, even on weekends, wh how concerned should we be about your burnout? <laughs> I think this is that this, goes to our president as well. I think this I think this weekend would be a double way to burn out um, given the uh, demands that were made on DPW fire and police with parking problems and the heat and everything else and they all deserve enormous amounts of credit. 
for handling some very tense situations at the high school. And then in our town next to us, there was another meet going on. So in general, the town was pretty crowded. Mm -hmm. And our right. staff was feeling it all over the place. I mean, I appreciate your concern. I think we care for each other and we pay attention to each other. And I think asking the question is really valuable, but we'll, right. I think we're okay. Yeah. Is the HR person, would that, would the new HR person be looking into something like this at all? In terms of? Um, um, burn burnout. It would probably come up through the performance review process more than, uh, mm -hmm. but it's something she, they do a lot of wellness programs but probably the people who need it probably would not engage in the, in the wellness programs, right? right? right. Dorothy. Well, um, it, it does seem to me that you've done an incredible job of getting the work done with the staff you had, but I also think it looks like we need more staff because I, I, this kind of thing, it can't continue too long before people get unhappy. Um, and I don't know what's, any, in, the, in the budget coming up, is there anything for more staff in FY20? Uh, we haven't done the budget for next for FY21, um, but I think that that will be a, a. It comes up here. It comes up with lots of different departments. Um, I think this year um, we get a better. We'll have a better sense of what the demands on. What, what, we need to get to a steady state. We can't really judge on the first seven months of the council because that was, it was right. a truly crazy time. We're hoping we'll get into a steady state. I think we've, you know, we've learned in the clerk's office that there are certain demands that have, that were, it was really a strain to meet them this year. Um, so managing that, other departments as well. So, but we talk about that a lot. It came up to the, this morning actually about needing additional staff in one of our departments. I think the council's looking for a steady state as well. Um, are there other questions at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move to a quick slide presentation and this is a way of bringing you all up to date. Uh, and I just wanna ask Paul and also my District 2 counselor to join in this since it's been a project. As mentioned earlier uh, by Dave Zomack, and by Paul, um, we've had uh, an opportunity provided by Amherst College to actually actively now explore a site for DPW and a site for the fire station. Uh, the process has begun by having um, six different people from staff, um, including our three community participation officers, head of DPW, head of fire, and Dave Zomack. Uh, the assistant town manager go out and literally knock on doors, um, leaving messages trying to go back. And I know at least in one case where Pat herself has followed up with someone who was not able to talk to one of those people. Uh, we then had a Saturday where we met with people under a tent um, on Kiwanis Field. Uh, we were joined at that time by two of our at-large at counselors as well. And then, um, on the 8th of July, we had a, what we call a District 2 meeting, but in fact, it's open to anyone. We have another one of those tomorrow night, and we invite you to come again. Uh, we were fortunate to have at least two of our counselors, and I think, uh, Darcy, you came to that one as well. Um, and so, again, it's at Fort River at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. This is the presentation from July 8th. By tomorrow night, we will have a few additional slides. Let's just quickly go through them so you understand what we've been talking about to the public. We think of this as our three legs of, the, of uh, public safety, police, fire, and public works. This just gives you a sense that the most recent building we've built was the police station, uh, and that was back in 1990, uh, so almost 30 years ago. Um, the fire station headquarters was built in 29, the North Station in 75, and public works, well, it was, uh, building was built in 1915. We occupied it for public works in, in 1940. Next slide. 
So we looked very closely at what is fire and emergency medical services and gone over what they do. This is very much similar to the kinds of orientation we had when we talked with the fire department. And then we've just shared, for instance, the budget, the fact that there's 50 employees, and remembering in, in all occasions, it's not just fire, it's fire and EMS. Next slide. Um, so we have the two different stations. Obviously, it's the one central that is the most out of date, although I don't want to dismiss the fact that North Fire Station is also it, an aged facility. Go ahead. Obviously, we take out a few mirrors every once in a while. We keep supplying them. I think we're out right now. Uh, and then we give them some more background about the fire stations and particularly the various studies. Every one of them from 1966 up to 2006 recommended that something be built to the south of town. And you can go to that. In fact, I think recently I sent a map to somebody, Darcy maybe, um, where I showed the difference coverage of the, uh, it wasn't Darcy, I'll have to figure it out, but it's in the fire station study. Continuing. Uh, so back in 2018, town meeting did uh, uh, authorize $75,000. There was a um, feasibility study done. All that does is provide a conceptual design. In fact, I, like many people, have come to say I wish they would never put a dollar figure in them, but they do because the dollar figure is enormously misleading. That in that study, we looked at a variety of different locations, some of which the town had access to, some of which they didn't. Ultimately, what is really the best location is the current DPW site. Two of the other most talked about locations, one is right off of mm, Palmeray, right behind the Valley Transport. It's a smaller location, and it has a protected species on it. It's just a, a barely over two acres, and we really need three to four acres for the fire. And then the other one was the South uh, Amherst Commons, where the old school is. And again, it's not, it's, I think it's 2.9 acres, but has some slope problems with it, et cetera. This is the DPW site right off of West Street 116. You can call it any number of names. I've heard at least three names for that road. Um, and that's where the DPW site is right now. We would basically move to most of the front of the space. The back of the space actually would not be as needed. Uh, it's about 7.5 to 8 acres, so it's not big enough for a DPW. Moving on. So once we get to the point we say, okay, DPW would go here and fire would go here, now we move to what's called schematic design. And one of the reasons why this is so important to the council is that the schematic design is what allows you to get to the point you can start making decisions. What's actually going to go into this building, and how big does it have to be, and what will it approximately cost? You get to the better cost estimates. And it's only then that we can start saying, well, you know, maybe we can't do it this way because as we look at all four of the big projects in order to do them we have to cut back someplace and this is one of the issues and then you move to your actual construction documents and actually move on to construction and funding the construction the thing that this um, schematic design has to include that the feasibility study did not include is the application of the net zero energy requirements. And so that's an additional thing that has to be engineered into this one as well. So moving on to DPW, because if we're successful and after listening to the public and standing back and talking about it, we really are hoping to look seriously at this site that Amherst College has offered. Um, DPW is a comprehensive DPW. If you compare it to other DPWs, you have to do things like, does that DPW deal with water? Does that DPW deal with cemeteries? Does it do 
the recs and rec recreation, parks and recreation, et cetera. Ours is a comprehensive DPW, again, giving some sense of what they do. The present facilities, there are actually four. It's the old DP, it's the DPW site. There's the water treatment plan. There's the trees and grounds, which would be desirable to move to the new facility. It is next to the pool at the high school, so it's not even in an optimal place. And then there's the transfer station. Obviously, the transfer station and the water wastewater treatment plant can't be moved, nor can the water sources, et cetera. Okay? So we have the old... DPW building, we've talked about it before. If you haven't taken a tour, please do. We'll, we'll make an opportunity for that. Uh, it is a challenge. Its actual foundation is crumbling. There's parts of its roof that have collapsed. There's newer parts of the building, and, and yet older parts do not have the kind of safety and ventilation op opportunities. If you actually look at the uh, study that was done on the feasibility, renovation of that facility would cost as much as tearing it down and starting over. Next. Like with, just like with the fire, there was a feasibility study done. Again, it cost 75000 And out of it, uh, nine sites were actually looked at. Uh, we are going to be including those in the slides for tomorrow night. And for various reasons, some of those sites are no longer available. Some are not considered optimal sites. And actually, the Amherst College site was not even in those because it had not been offered at the time of the study. So this is the field. Um, how best to describe this? On your left is Southeast Street. On your far right, going off this way, is Route 9. And then Stanley Street comes down into that point with it. And uh, the field is the bigger field in the center. Ah. Uh, no, no, I think southeast, southeast is on your left, up here. Southeast is on your, no, southeast street is on your left. Okay, all right. So it's that large field has access both to Stanley Street and to Southeast Street. Um, obviously, some of the area, however, is wetlands. Moving on. Um, so, th one of the things about having a site is you can't do a schematic design until you have a site. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the th reasons the DPW Fire Station Advisory Committee basically stalled out is because we didn't have a site. So, what this provides is an opportunity to seriously look at a site, and if we move forward, then we can do the schematic design with all of the things that go into it, like traffic studies and environmental and geotechnical investigations, et cetera. And then you move like with the other. It also, when we did the, D, when the DPW feasibility study was done, it did not include net zero. So the schematic design study will have to include net zero. And that really brings us to the fact, is this a done deal? And the, we're, we're in the process of exploring both sites to determine suitability for both DPW and fire. And we're soliciting and listening to concerns of neighbors and abutters. Uh, we've even had a couple of people suggest to us that this is the way the town should do projects, which is nice to hear that we've actually gone out. Uh, we've provided feedback forms, meetings, um, and again, urge if you are willing to have another night out tomorrow night at six o'clock. You can hear what some of the neighbors have to say. Okay. Questions? This is not the last time you'll hear about these projects. Yes, Dorothy. Um, in, in looking at the field, um, there's one area where it's pretty up to the backyards of some houses. Mm -hmm. What amelioration uh, effects have you, have they suggested or have you been thinking about um, to make it uh, more acceptable? That is a question we have out there to people. You know, do they feel like we need to put 
berms in? Do they feel like we need to put, would they like to see more, um, at, you know, some kind of park, athletic facilities, gardens? We're not even there yet mm -hmm. at this point. Pat, do you have further mm -hmm. comment on that? Yeah. But it's one of the things we're asking the neighbors. I will say that in the process, other neighbors have come forward and said, but what about our streets and what about Route 9? So it's an opportunity for this neighborhood to kind of put it all out there, yeah. which is fine. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, then we're going to continue to move on. So the next item is rules of procedure first reading. We're now back to action item. And in this case, it's 7B. And um, OK. So Evan, you're on for this one. Yes. Since Mandy Jo is yes. not available. So. Um, after our Rules of Procedure Committee wrapped up, uh, there were a few things that were uh, outstanding with Rules of Procedure. Um, and one of the things that the Ad Hoc Rules of Procedure Committee did was provide uh, a list of sort of unfinished business along with some insight into the debate uh, that they had had and even in some cases some recommended uh, text or recommended actions. Uh, now that ad hoc rules of procedure has been dissolved, the rules lie with governance organization and legislation. Um, and so over our past three meetings, uh, we have discussed the uh, list that was given to us by rules of procedure. Um, since Mandy Jo is not here, I will be speaking to them as vice chair. Um, so you saw in the GOL report that is in your packet, all of the changes that were made. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because some of them were, fine, were fairly minor, some of them were just corrections, um, but I do want to just highlight some of the things we did and perhaps provide some insight as to why um, beyond what was provided in the report. Um, so we did add a table of contents. Uh, we did, and this is to Mandy Joe's credit because this was a tremendous amount of work, added hyperlinks that link to the charter MGL um, or CMR, and in fact, if you, if you click on the hyperlink, it doesn't just take you to the charter, it takes you to the page of the charter uh, where oh. that reference is. Um, so it's not just the charter, it's the page that it's on. So uh, I will take no credit for that. That was all Mandy Joe's work, um, which should surprise no one. Um, some of the more substantive things we did, I'll uh, run through these. One is Rule 2.2H, which is on page three of Rules of Procedure. Uh, we added a rule that did not exist before. Um, with regard to one of the roles of the president, the rule reads, the president shall serve as spokesperson of the council for all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. Uh, there had been a lot of uh, questions and uncertainty over when it's appropriate for counselors to respond to correspondence, when it's appropriate to respond to press inquiries, um, and we sought to highlight that the only person who can speak on behalf of the full council um, to inquiries and correspondence that are addressed to the full council would be the president, but we did not want to restrict the ability of any individual counselor to respond um, to a press inquiry or correspondence as an individual counselor, um, simply to clarify that anything that's looking for comment from the council as a whole would come from the president. Uh, page six, rule. Uh, 3.5B4 um, has to do with executive session minutes. Uh, this was something that was actually brought to us not by rules of procedure, I don't believe, but by our former town clerk um, who acknowledged that even though we have been going into executive session uh, with some regularity, that's not always the case and sometimes there can be fairly long spans of time to go into an executive session. Um, and since you can only approve executive session minutes in executive session, uh, that means there's the potential that there could be really long spans of time in which executive session minutes are not approved. And so this rule requires us to um, go into uh, executive session not more than three months 
um, when needed to approve executive session minutes. Uh, this differs from other communities, we should say. I believe that Northampton, don't quote me on that, um, uh, allows the president to just approve executive session minutes. Um, and so uh, GOL, um, by consensus, decided to keep this responsibility with the council, but to make sure that it's done regularly. Uh, page 17. We changed rule 8.2C. So this has to do with referrals. So right now, um, all town manager appointments are automatically referred to OCA, and all bylaws are automatically referred to GOL, um, but all financial measures uh, have to have a council referral. There was no automatic referral, um, and GOL wanted to see automatic referral of uh, financial measures um, authorizing a loan, levying a tax expenditure of money. However, uh, one issue came up, which was that uh, the town manager files the budget on May 1. If it is an automatic referral of the budget to the Finance Committee, that means the Finance Committee then gets referred the budget on May 1. The Finance Committee then has 30 days to report back to the Council. That is really difficult to do um, because that essentially gives the Finance Committee uh, two meetings, given our meeting schedule, to report back. And given that that last Monday is very often a holiday, um, it actually gives the Finance Committee an even shorter span of time. Um, and so if you remember this month, the Finance Committee gave their report, I believe, in our first June meeting. Um, and so what this rule does is it automatically refers all financial measures to Finance Committee with the exception of the budget so that the budget is still referred by the council, which buys the finance committee a little bit of extra time to report back to the council, so it doesn't have to be done by May 30, uh, recognizing that that can be logistically challenging. Uh, page 22 of the rules. Um, one thing that we did is Appendix B uh, was intended to be copies of all the committee charges. We recommended deletion of Appendix B and instead uh, inserted hyperlinks to the charges. Um, what this does is, one, it doesn't add just a whole bunch of pages to our rules of procedure, but also should these charges be updated or revised, uh, we don't have to go back and replace them in the rules of procedure because they'll be replaced on the town website and this hyperlinks to it. Page 23, uh, this was a rule that we are recommending deletion. It is 10.6J, uh, we're recommending deletion and renumbering 10.6K uh, to 10.6J. Uh, this rule previously read, committees have the right and obligation to be creative, offer opinions, including majority and minority views, and produce documents. Uh, there was a feeling that this rule didn't necessarily do anything. Um, it wasn't actually, it's, it's labeled as a rule, but isn't actually a rule. We felt it was more of a value statement that actually exists already within Appendix A, which is the Town Council values, um, and the statement that uh, there needs to be inclusion of majority and minority views is actually already included in what is now the new 10.6 J1, uh, which includes minority views. And so we felt as though the only actual rule, which was inclusion of majority and minority views, is already in an existing rule. Um, the other part of it was a value statement, and so we're recommending deletion of that. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, <laughs> and then the last sort of substantive one was 10.10. Uh, 10. Uh, it had been left the Finance Committee may include members of the public who shall have no a voice but no vote in the Finance Committee's deliberations, and we just specified that the appointment of that it lies with the Council. There was some discussion about whether we wanted to actually write out the appointment process, the OCA appointment process for Finance Committee, and we decided not to do that. Um, just to specify that it's not a presidential appointment, but is a council appointment. And the very last thing, speaking of OCA, that we did was recommend deletion of Appendix C, OCA appointment um, and appointment confirmation process, given that that is sort of in flux, given that that might be perpetually in flux, um, it didn't seem wise to include it uh, or necessary to include it as part of the rules. Um, so those were the, I would say, the major revisions. There were a lot of other smaller things we did. Like I said, most of them were simple corrections, um, but the major revisions to the rules were those. The one thing that we have not gotten to 
um, is 10.5 work groups. Um, that is one that we were tasked with. We have discussed it, I think, twice in OCA, and we uh, simply have not gotten to the point where we're ready to bring forth a recommendation. Um, it is on our agenda for Wednesday's meeting. Um, perhaps we will have something to you by August 19th, but that's the one rule that we were uh, referred to that we did not get to. Uh, the one other thing I want to note, just because it was in the rules of procedure um, recommendation sheet, was there was a suggestion of adding an index. We opted not to do that. One, because it is logistically challenging, and two, because we felt like picking which words would go in the index would be both a laborious and arbitrary uh, process. And so we felt that the table of contents that we added um, was sufficient to provide guidance to people. So at that point, I'll entertain any questions. I, this is just a first reading. We're not voting tonight because we adopted a rule that we don't do that. Thank you. Um, and first of all, for an amazing technologically current document, wow. So uh, questions at this point? Yes, Alyssa. So one's a question for future um, GOL consideration, especially because of the great technology you guys are using. But um, we knew that the rules were going to get revised fairly quickly because we knew we'd found a typo in the way that we laid out the part about the voting and that sort of thing. So thanks for fixing everything and clarifying things. But I think it's important once we have them adopted that we have them available on the town website as well as in our SharePoint because I have a difficult time accessing all the documentation that's in SharePoint, say on my phone or through a different thing. And sometimes I want to look up, hey, how many votes do we need for that in the charter and in the rules? And so because the rules are a little more plain English version of things. So figuring out where to keep things I know is one of the things that rules ask GOL to help figure out comes true for policies too and I appreciate the appendices that you took off but again just where we should expect to ourselves find things on the town website and where we can tell other people to find them um, so that's a future discussion in terms of sp a specific question actually or comment I guess is more accurate in 2.2 H one of the first ones you brought up Evan associated with president and spokesperson with the disclaimer that I was desperate to put this rule in in the first place and got outvoted at rules of procedure so I'm super happy to see it in here but what I would also like to mention is that I appreciate that you tried to be sensitive to the worries that were expressed back then at rules and again apparently at GOL about you know quashing individual members ability to talk or something which people were nervous about and that's why it didn't end up in the first version and I appreciate what this says but at the same time I still think that as a c culture that this body should agree and somehow perhaps in future make it clearer in our rules if we at least get this one in then maybe we can revise it again in the future that when it comes to speaking for the town council it is the president's job to do that. We said that when we elected the president. Or if the president wants to say, oh, you know, Pat, you go talk about that thing, and that's fine if you designate somebody. But I don't want anybody, I hope, to interpret this rule now because of the way it was carefully crafted, that just because the newspaper calls you and asks you what the town council did, I don't think it's your job to answer that unless you're the president or the designee. I think it's fine when you're talking to a constituent that's talked to you personally about a thing and you're not committing the council to something and you're talking about your viewpoint. And I think it's fine that it's clear in this rule now that if somebody writes to town council at, that everybody's expecting that the president's going to respond or she's going to say, hey, you've talked about this a lot. Would you go do it? And that would be fine too. Delegation's a great thing. But I really don't want counselors to see this as carte blanche to, if the newspaper calls us up to ask us about our rules discussion tonight, that I should just go ahead and discuss that. I don't think I should. I think that should be the president's choice to do that or to designate somebody else to do it. Additional comments or questions? Uh, to, um, I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah, so in that example, I don't think we were very careful for a rule that didn't prevent the counselors from talking to the media about, so there, there shouldn't be anything that prevents me from talking to the media about the rules discussion as long as it's clear that I'm not speaking for the council, but it might be an issue that's really important to me and I might be you know, a, a very good resource for a particular issue. So the, so 
I think that media relations is actually a really important part of the training that we should have, like when to speak to the press and when not to speak to the press. But I don't think, so we're all political figures, right? So we all, um, the media plays a very important role between individual councilors and the whole council and the constituency. So it's a way of communicating. Additional comments or questions? This is the first reading. Is there Are there any particular changes that have been made that you want to further discuss? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I have a question. On page 20, um, 9.4, 9.5, number of votes required. I'm just um, curious about them. I, uh, it, I guess 9.5. Some things take 10 votes in favor for passage and some take nine. And the one that took 10 was a properly protested zoning bylaw change, but it takes nine for a zoning bylaw change. So I don't know what properly protested means. Mr. Bockelman, would you like to take a stab at that one? <laughs> or perhaps one of our pre former planning board members wants to do it. I believe that in the, um, there's a nuance in the, law, in the zoning bylaw that if you, if you are protesting a zoning bylaw, it has a higher threshold. I don't know the citation, I'd have to look it up. I'm sure there's proper steps you have to follow yeah. to be on record that you are properly protesting that bylaw. And if you have followed those steps, then it's considered proper. And therefore, the threshold to on that one would be 10 versus 9, which was what it would have originally been. So I guess it means if you want to change a bylaw, you don't protest it. You kind of keep it to yourself so that it only takes nine votes to change it. I mean, it's. Um, Evan, do you want to speak to I, this? You look like no, you not really. Um, but w what I just want to clarify is uh, that the the rule that Dor the the vote that Dorothy is, um, yeah. I'm sorry, the rule that Dorothy is highlighting was not something that GOL changed. No, it's mass. Uh, that was wrong. something that was already in there. It's MGL. It's also in the charter. The only change that we made to 9.5 was votes on unpaid bills and borrowing authorization, and that was just moving them from items requiring at least a two-thirds of counselors present to items requiring at least nine votes, um, and that was in response to town attorney opinion. And so th those are the only recommended revisions that GOL is, is, right. is making. When we get to the issue of anything being properly protested, I am sure we will consult with our town attorney. <laughs> Other questions about any of the recommended changes? Again, this is only the first reading, and um, I will say that if GOL comes back with uh, anything substantial on the issue of work groups, then we'll discuss that and we'll have to delay the second reading until we've had a second time to look at that, okay? But otherwise, we'll go ahead with the second reading on the 19th of August. Okay, Dorsey. I just have one comment, um, having been on the Ad Hoc Rules Committee. I, um, I guess I find it disconcerting that, you know, there are a couple of things in here that the Ad Hoc Rules Committee uh, discussed and voted on and then the full council voted on to accept, but now the GOL is either deleting or adding something that we didn't put in, but that we did discuss in the okay. ad hoc rules committee. So that seems wrong. Could to you me. be more specific? <laughs> Please. Yeah, uh, well, the 10.6J, uh, there was, you know, discussion about that. We voted on that in the Ad Hoc Rules Committee, and then we had discussion about that in the full council, and we voted on it, and it stayed in. Um, and um, the section that Alyssa was mentioning in... 
Uh, like she said, that was something that we discussed in ad hoc rules and voted on. Um, then the full council didn't vote on it because it didn't get into the rules. Um, so now the GOL is putting it in. So I know that GOL is now taking over the rules. So that is their, their responsibility now, but it just feels like it's, um, like they're, that the GOL should respect at least the work that's already been done by the Ad Hoc Rules Committee and not flip it. Um, Are there comments? Is my opinion. <laughs> I understand your point. I don't know that I agree with it, but I understand it. I mean, at, at any point in time, a committee assigned to look at, to relook at something can come back with a change, recognizing where it has been in the past and what the action might have been. And the council can decide they're not going to accept it or not, but the committee, GOL in this case, was assigned to look at that. Evan. Yeah, I do want to also make clear that I think GOL in discussing these gave great deference to what came out of ad hoc rules and procedure, um, including when um, language was put forth to us from ad hoc rules and procedure, uh, we, we u always use that as the starting off point. And so we used what rules and procedure gave us, um, and I think our work was in large part um, fixing in some places, uh, and then also uh, finishing up some of the work and in the discussions and looking at how to finish up some of that work, uh, there were realizations that perhaps some things um, didn't need to be there or did need to be there um, based on prior discussions. But I will say, you know, one of, one of the reasons that we haven't finished work groups um, is because there's been some questioning in GOL about whether work groups are something that are workable. Um, and we wanted to pause that discussion because we wanted to give deference to, to, to ad hoc rules and procedure and go back to um, your deliberations to make sure. So I think we are actually doing a great deal to respect the, the work of um, rules of procedure, um, but at the same time, with GOL is now the keeper of the rules, um, and, and, and we're working to make sure that the rules are as effective as they can be. So given this, however, I would like to go back to 2.2H and ask if there is further discussion about this. And that is to add the sentence, serve as spokesperson, the president shall serve as spokesperson of the council for all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. That doesn't mean the councilors themselves cannot talk to the press. It just means that when we're actually responding on behalf of the council, it's the president's job. And since I do emails to the point that it's crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I had kind of wondered about that. So when an email comes to all the members of the town council, right. and I see that you've replied right away, I'm really happy. Most of the time I say, wow, she did that. I can't imagine how she did it. And then I kind of feel I don't have to reply unless I have something particular to add. Is that appropriate? The, the real issue is you can't get into deliberating. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be careful about replying. I try to create a response, first of all. I mean, I, after seven and a half months of doing this and having volunteered because I did not want a... <laughs> Uh, standard reply that says, oh, I've received your email and we'll get back to you later. Yeah. To me, that's not what my job is. My job is to be a lot more responsive. And you will notice that on occasion when I reply, I use exactly the same words, no matter you know who it is. If you then want to reply further, you can, but what and please feel free to do that at any point in time. But what you have to be very careful is we don't get into a del deliberation on that e at that using that email as the base. 
Are there further advice on that from Paul or anybody? Alyssa, yes. I was just going to ask that we just all then, just as you said, just keep in mind that if you do decide to do that, one, you probably want to check in with the president first and say, well, I've been having a long conversation with this person, and so I'm going to talk to them about this. I think that would be a perfectly reasonable check-in. And the other thing is to only respond to the person, potentially copy the president, but don't copy two or three other counselors just saying, mm -hmm. well, that's not a quorum, so it's fine. Yeah. Don't do that, because as soon as one of them shares that information at the coffee shop with somebody else, now you're really flirting with serial deliberation. So make yeah. sure that you keep it to yourself and potentially to the president, mm -hmm. or you know, like if Paul's involved, for and, example. And I will tell you, and I, I think each of you maybe at some point have experienced this, if it's an issue at which to which I think you know more about this than I do, and I need your advice, I will often seek your advice before I write the email. So the, if somebody sends an email just to me. That's different. I can answer that, good. So I haven't been answering the, the ones to the whole council, but I was feeling guilty about it. So now you're saying I should not feel guilty. Mm. No. Yes, shall we? So I've also been copying you and Paul when I respond one on one. Uh -huh. And is that recommend? I mean, I think it's it makes recommended. Sense. Yeah. Uh, certainly, yeah. there are individual conversations, but it does help keep us apprised of what's going on. It doesn't have to be, but yes. So these are viewed as good practices and, and good sense, but I felt we didn't think there's any way you could put this into a rule. <laughs> so um, uh, we could create a rule, which is counselors are required to use good sense. But I, um, we felt that that this was, <laughs> and we would be violating it a lot. Yes. <laughs> so that's why it is as vague as it is. But we felt that this was. Yeah. Um, okay. Any further discussion on two point two? All right. Then the other one I want to go to is. Uh, 10.6J, is that the one, Mark Darcy? Yes. Is there, for, is there discussion on this? This is the one where we struck the words, uh, under powers and duties of standing on ad hoc committees, we struck J, which says committees have the right and obligation to be creative, offer opinions, including majority or minority views, and produce documents. And I believe that some of this was because it was covered right below that. So we actually felt that all of it was covered. Um, so including majority minority views and produced documents, that's the next rule, uh, one, which is all about the producing reports that include minority views. And then that first part, commun uh, committees have the right and obligation to be creative, we felt was uh, adequately covered under Appendix A, the second bullet, creativity and innovation. And so uh, it seemed duplicative and it didn't necessarily seem like it was uh, that first half didn't feel like it was a rule necessarily, was unenforceable and unadministerable. I personally want to say, looking at what GOL has done, the fact that they had the tremendous work of the ad hoc rules of procedure committee to start with has made their job a lot easier. So it's not in any way to diminish that or any previous council discussions. If there's no further discussions, we'll conclude the first reading, but let me go back and say, if you want to come forward with a suggestion for work groups, I'm going to suggest that at, on the 19th, we deal with this as the second re reading and that work groups be done as a separate conversation or addition to the, to the rules. So that we, you don't, first of all, I don't want you to feel the pressure of having to get it done by then. And second of all, I have the feeling it's going to create some conversation that I don't want to prevent these changes from being made. Okay. Yes, Alyssa. 
I want to agree with you 100% on that for exactly for all the timing reasons you just described. And I think we could end up having a really long discussion about working group. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, because I didn't want Dorothy to walk away thinking that about the 9 and 10 votes a lot. If you look up the MGL reference, it is an extremely obscure portion of state law. I bet Steve has this memorized. Where three, there's a three quarters vote required, which is how we got to 10. And it's associated with ownership of 20% or more of the area of the land proposed to be included in the zoning change. So it's this really weird provision that's about people who own property mm -hmm. around a change in zoning. Good. They Good. protest, and then there's a 10-person vote. I've, when we talked about this a year ago or something, um, I hadn't ever heard of it being used in Amherst. People didn't even know it existed in Mass General Law. So it's a really odd thing, but it's important. It's important to include it in, you know, in the vote counts, but it's not something you're going to get to use as a clever point of order during a meeting. Not gonna... Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the clarification and for pointing that. out that obscure law to us. When we talk about your backyard, Dorothy, we'll talk about it. Um, OK. Uh, are there any other questions at this point on rules of procedure? If not, we'll move on to appointments. Okay. So appointments. The first one uh, is the director of senior services. And let me just point out that although um, there is an item under uh, items to um, topics not reasonably anticipated by the president 48 hours in advance of the meeting, I'm going to move that up, and that's the Board of Health. So we're going to talk both about town manager appointments to the Director of Senior Services and then also the appointments to the Board of Health. Evan? Okay, let's start with Paul. Sure. Paul, sure. Director of Senior Services, and then I'll call on the committee. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. So I am, have referred uh, Mary Beth Ogulovitz, um, who uh, is from East Hampton, Massachusetts, as the Director of Senior Services. Uh, there is a memo in your packet that, that talks a little bit about her background, have included her resume and her um, cover letter as well. Um, the, um, Mary Beth is a, in a, is a is a practicing attorney. She's been an attorney. Uh, she began her career uh, working for uh, a court, but then also has moved on to um, serving as a in the as a, a district attorney, um, and with a focus on a criminal prosecutor, where she focused on homicide, sexual assault, child abuse, and elder abuse. Um, she began her legal career as a law clerk in the for the Justice of the Superior Court. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Boston College, a law degree from Western New England University, and master's in social work from Westfield State. She has an unusual path to become this because she started as a, as a lawyer. She moved into social work and, um, and I think mostly motivated by personal circumstances with her parents, became very engaged in uh, senior issues concerning seniors. Um, she impressed everyone uh, in that she that we that interviewed her with her passion and um, her creativity and how she wanted to and, uh, approach um, delivering senior services to the town of Amherst, and um, we felt that the, or I felt that this was the right person at the right time because uh, she's filling very large shoes in the sense that uh, Nancy Bagano has been with the town for 47 years. And whoever was going to come in uh, following Nancy was going to be have, have a very large uh, job to fill. And um, I think Mary Beth was the right person to come in and sort of address the issues that, um, for that, that always come up when there's change happening. Uh, she's a really good listener. Uh, she's a high communicator um, and really eager to contribute to the town of Amherst. Um, now, G-O-L. Oka. Oka. You're wearing a little too I many know, hats double, tonight. I know. Yeah. I'm double duty this yeah. week. Chair of both committees. Um, so Oka, so, so the town manager filed uh, this appointment on July 9th. Uh, unfortunately, G, uh, Oka, look what you did to me. Oka 
uh, didn't have a meeting until this morning, um, which was the earliest we could consider this. So my apologies to my colleagues on the council for not having a written report on this, um, but I did not have sufficient time to produce one uh, given OCA's two hour and 38 minute meeting this morning. Um, so this is the second time OCA has been referred uh, a town manager appointment to a department head. You'll remember the first one was in January with the human resources director. At that time, OCA was still getting itself together and did not really have the capacity to uh, thoroughly make a recommendation. Uh, this time, we worked hard uh, to um, have, a, have a really, I think, rich discussion in the committee about sort of what we're looking for. Um, it, as to our role in this process and what we are looking to advise you on. And so uh, we were lucky to have the town manager present later in the meeting, which gave us early part of the meeting to come up with um, our questions for the town manager. It was a, a good discussion. I do want to go through some of them because I think that some of the questions that we asked um, and that he answered might be questions that you all have. Um, and since you weren't in the meeting um, and it'd be too late to go watch the video later, uh, I can give you them now. So the, one area of concern uh, was the fact that uh, of 28 applicants, two people were put forward, but because one withdrew, only one person was actually interviewed. And there was a question about uh, what the conversation was like, uh, why, why when one person withdrew was not another name put forward, um, and was it sufficient to only interview a single applicant. Um, the response to that was that the screening committee put forth two people because they felt like those were the two people who met their standards um, and that to go back and put forth another person just because someone withdrew um, would not be appropriate because they didn't put that person forward in the first place because they didn't rise to uh, what are the very high standards of this community and, and, and um, this position. Uh, second one was there were some questions about uh, becoming uh, essentially director of the senior center, but having no experience uh, in a senior center. Um, and a lot of that came from a question about what the town manager's vision is for this position. And, and I thought that was really interesting that was brought up by uh, one of my colleagues to my right. Um, with regard to you know, hearing where is, where is this going, what is this going to be doing? Um, and the town manager described uh, a vision of director of senior services that goes beyond just the senior center. Um, but really, actually it's really interesting that you gave, we have this in front of us today, because literally he asked the question, what does it mean to be age friendly, which just happens to be on the cover of uh, the municipal advocate. Um, and there was talk about how with the focus of aging in place, um, a lot of this position is less so about managing a building and more so about policy, thinking about transportation activities, um, and then that goes beyond just managing a senior center. Um, and so even though this person didn't necessarily have the supervision experience or, or, or the experience running a senior center or working a senior center or even working directly with elder care, uh, the experiences this person brought matched what is his vision for what senior services look like in Amherst. Um, and, and there was an interest in sort of out of the box thinking. Uh, one thing that was interesting that Oka brought forth that I think will eventually involve all the council um, is the idea that it was really useful to hear the town manager's vision for senior services and it would have been even more useful perhaps to hear it several months ago and not when we had um, uh, a, a candidate in front of us. And one of the conversations we had that uh, the town manager seemed amenable to, uh, at least this morning, um, was coming, coming to the council I think earlier in a process and saying here's my vision for this department where there's a vacancy. Um, and providing the council an opportunity to perhaps author their vision, which is derived from our experiences with our constituents, um, so that the search can be sort of guided from the beginning through that, but also later when we're looking at candidates, we can say, well, we had this discussion about what your vision is. Does the candidate you bring forward, uh, do the qualifications match what you told us was your vision for this department? And so involving the council, uh, at least OCA, but if not the full council earlier in the process would be really useful and, and we, sort of started that this morning with uh, the town clerk um, and, and what some ideas were we had of what we're looking for in a town clerk. Um, there was a question about the screening committee and whether there's any outreach to people who actually receive services. Um, and the answer was that there was some informal outreach but no formal outreach um, to figure out sort of what the needs are. Um, we also asked for demographic information which you should have received in your email about 45 minutes to an hour ago? Just Oka. 
I guess I turn oh, you're so okay. Never mind. Um, oh, you know, we're always asking about uh, demographic information, and so um, there's always a question of if the pool is too small, that information might be identifying. Um, but we felt that with a 28-person pool, it would not be. Um, and we also asked for, uh, at some point, the job material so we could see where the position was posted. Um, and so my hope is that you feel as though OCA, this time around, did a very thorough job in looking at the candidate, asking tough questions, making sure that we feel comfortable moving forward. Um, and by the end of the meeting, OCA did vote unanimously to recommend the town council approve the town manager's appointment to the director of senior services. Questions or comments from the council? I only have one comment, and it comes from years of experience of hiring people. And that is, while I have a vision, it is often during the interview process that my vision gets solidified and sometimes changed. And so I hope that we will give the town manager that opportunity. Uh, and in fact, I find the best candidates are the ones that come themselves with a vision and can help shape the future vision. So I want to make sure we don't hold fast to some pre-stated vision without room for flexibility. Okay. Any other questions here or comments? Then uh, the motion for this is to approve the town manager's appointment of the senior services director. Do I hear a motion? George? A second? Shalini. Second. <laughs> we got, we got many a seconds. Okay. Uh, Shalini is the official second. Is there anything further comment? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's 11400 and two absent. Okay, we're going to move to the um, Board of Health. And again, this is town manager recommended appointments. And again, this was just acted on today, but we are gonna go ahead with it since we uh, won't be meeting for four weeks. So uh, can I start with the town manager? So you have um, three names in front of you. One is a, um, Re-appointment uh, of Stephen George, uh, which I did not put his address in. Apologize for that. Uh, Mr. George is an existing member of the Board of Health, uh, has um, been on the Board of Health since 2016. He's a long-term member of the Amherst College faculty where he teaches neurobiology. There are two other people, and there were two vacancies on the Board of Health. Um, the first person is Maureen Malia, 1510 Southeast Street, who is a retired physician. She was the uh, uh, general, in she had general internal medicine in a variety of settings, but for the past 20, 20 years, she served as a medical director of student health services at Mount Holyoke College. And the third person is, is Timothy Randahir, who is a professor at the University of Massachusetts and a scientist who specializes in environmental, environmental science and hydrology. He lives at 100 Columbia Drive. Um, so the Board of Health has a very broad mandate, and, and part of the packet is to sort of is to list the charge of the committee, but also some of the information in addition that was um, that the Board of Health is responsible for. In Board of Health, you think of just health issues, but it also approves well permits. It addresses um, drinking water situations in the um, schools. Um, and it can address uh, outbreaks of uh, contagious diseases. So they always like to have a physician on the board. They always like to have someone who knows, who an has an engineering background, special hydrogeology. They have a very strong can uh, member uh, in, in Dr. John Tobiasen now, but they uh, were identified as a need as someone who will also bring additional uh, tools to this and both uh, people have the time and capacity to take on this responsibility. Okay. Oka? This is us, me too. Um, I'll keep this one brief. Oka voted unanimously this morning to recommend town council approve the town manager's appointments to Board of Health. Uh, there was minimal deliberation, mostly with regard to um, conversations with the town manager about what to include in uh, uh, appointee profiles. 
Is there any further question or discussion? Okay. Um, Athena, I'm going to make this motion uh, read exactly like the other one we have since we've gone through a review of that. So it would be to appoint the following individuals as members of the Board of Health for a three-year term to begin July 23rd, 2019 and expires on June 30th, 2022, Stephen George. And for a two-year term to begin July 23, 2019 and expire on June 30th, 2021, uh, Maureen Milia and Timothy Radher. Do I hear a motion? Yes, Second. Okay. Pat. Any further discussion? What was the verb? Huh? What was the verb in the motion? To appoint. So we're not appoint. Well, you said appoint, right? Yeah. It's a, but it's to it, approve. It should be to confirm. We're not appointing. It should be to approve. So we'll take that as a friendly amendment. Is that acceptable? Okay. It's to approve. Okay. Um, okay. All those in favor? Raise hands and say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, uh, abstain? None. And two absent. Okay. Uh, moving right along. Non-voting members of Finance Committee. Um, this is, um, totally goes to Oka. This one goes to Oka, but I'm going to hand it over to Darcy. Okay. I was the, um, the Oka designee in charge of these these particular appointments of non-voting residents to the Finance Committee. And on July 1st, we, um, we had a vote um, after three deliberation, um, or three days, meeting days, where we discussed procedural issues and the applicants. Um, and uh, we voted three in favor, two against, um, to recommend to the town council the appointment as non-voting residents of the finance committee. Uh, these people, Mary Lou Tileman for a term of one year, Sharon Povinelli for a term of two years, and Robert Hegner for a term of two years. So <clears throat> I am not going to go through um, the three days of deliberation and everything that happened. We have that in our report. You can read it. Um, and, uh, but I am going to talk about the, the applicants themselves. If you, I'm on page 12 of 23 of the report. <laughs> um, if you want to follow along, uh, that's my actual report to the OCA committee. Um, about the applicants, their profiles, and so on, and what happened, why, why I recommended them. So um, I recommended Mary Lou Tileman. Um, uh, she has been on the former finance committee. She was the chair of the most recent finance committee, and she has a broad wealth of knowledge about municipal finance, the budget, and specifically the Amherst, Amherst finances. Um, she has a special interest in schools, and she recently, uh, currently serves on the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, and she was someone who um, I chose partially because the Finance Committee specifically requested someone who has um, expertise in municipal and Amherst financial um, issues. So um, secondly, I chose Sharon Povinelli. Um, she also had been on the former finance committee. She had just um, finished just over one year before the former finance committee dissolved. Um, she has um, 
uh, financial expertise also. She's a downtown business owner. Um, she's a treasurer of both her business and of um, the bid. Uh, and finally, I chose Robert Hegner. Who, he's new. He's a fresh face. He's, um, he really stood out to me as um, having uh, for 11 years been a senior vice president at a $1.2 billion global consulting firm um, where he managed a $79 million HUD CDBG contract to help New Jersey recover from Hurricane Sandy. And he has experience with all aspects of financial management. Um, I was especially interested in the fact that he had developed innovative financial and project management dashboards that track performance against program expenditures and provide projections of future performance. So he would be someone new. Um, I used the finance committee suggested criteria, which is listed here on this report, which is um, experience serving on finance committees or other private or public boards, training expertise in economics, finance, policy, or comparable areas, or experience or interest in municipal finance. Um, I asked um, Sonia Aldrich, the interim um, finance director, to join me in the interviews uh, because I do not have expertise in finance, and so that was very helpful for her to be involved uh, and in helping me evaluate the candidates. And... Um, Uh, you can see um, the various, in the report, you can see the applicant letter that was sent to the people who were offered a position. Um, you can see the interview questions, um, the demographics. It, actually, the demographics in the interview questions are, there's an um, amended report that is just before this in this long list of uh, information that will that tells about the demographics and the what the exact interview questions were. So I am going to stop there. Uh, I'm hoping that the the council will um, will appoint these three new members of the of as non-voting members of the finance committee. Are there comments? Yes, Shalini. Um, I think it was really um, exciting to see that there were so many really, really good candidates who applied. Um, before I ask other question, I just want to hear from the two committee members who didn't vote for this and what was their perspective? I'd be happy. So I, uh, the OCA vote on this was 3-2. Uh, I was one of those two. Um, so if you'll remember from the first time we introduced you to the OCA process, uh, we, we put a fair amount of power in the OCA designee. Um, they are the only person who attends the interviews and they are the only person who puts forward names. Um, recognizing that power, OCA sought to impose some checks so that uh, it's not unfettered power. One of those checks was at the OCA level and the other was at the town council level. Um, my vote was, in my opinion, to use one of those checks. Um, and the reason for that being that uh, we had a discussion in OCA a long time ago about if you saw people in the pool who you thought would be better suited to the appointment. If you saw people in the pool who you would prefer, what do you do? Because as you all know, we don't bring forward or even discuss names of people who aren't brought forward. 
Um, and the answer was, well, you vote against the recommendations and ask the OCA designee to bring forth someone new with the hope that it's someone that you are looking for. And that's the situation I found myself in. I found that we had a very rich pool of qualified applicants. Um, and my concern happened to be with one of the people brought forward, uh, which was Mary Lou Talman. And the reason for that has nothing to do with her experience or expertise. She has served this town for a long time and, and done so very competently. Um, but with the idea being that although uh, OCA has not been rigid necessarily with term limits, there's been an idea that we are generally trying to abide by them. Um, Mary Lou Talman has served, even though this is a new finance committee in many ways, this is still the finance committee, uh, Mary Lou has served on the finance committee uh, since 2008. She is, she is, uh, was appointed to four different terms. This would essentially be her fifth term on the finance committee. And I felt that at some point it's useful to say to someone, we appreciate your service and we thank you for it, but it's time to bring on some new people. There were people in the applicant pool who I felt had the experience and qualifications that Darcy referenced that finance committee was looking for, um, but did so with either shorter tenure on the finance committee, who I thought were deserving of what would be perhaps a reappointment, um, and, who, and who didn't have uh, the 10 years of already serving on finance committee. And so since it was not possible for me to make a motion to replace one name with another, uh, my vote was um, against the recommended suite with the hope that we could go back into the pool of applicants and pull out some other people uh, who have the experience, the expertise, um, but do not have um, four terms on finance committee already under their belt. Are there additional comments or responses? Sarah. So my uh, problem with this had more to do with procedure and sticking to what I felt that OCA had used um, for rationale in the other appointments that we had made. And one was looking at the general health of a committee um, and how it would function with uh, certain people on it. And, and that I felt that, again, what um, Evan had said was that one of the things we took in consideration was um, how long people had served. And of course, that was also balanced with um, how much institutional knowledge was already there. And I just felt like Putting someone on, it was not personal. It, I just felt like when you already had some uh, very solid institutional knowledge on finance committee, um, I just didn't see the rationale of putting on someone who had, had served for so long. I, again, similar to what Evan had said, when there were other, there was, the pool was so much larger. So that was just, I was trying to stick to consistency to the things that we had already said. Are there additional comments? Darcy. I, I am not going to argue this issue, but I just would point people to the report, the deliberation, the three days of deliberation, because we, we, uh, we discussed the issue of term limits for one full meeting, almost. Um, so you can see the arguments pro and con about term limits there, which I don't necessarily think we need to go into here. Are there other comments at this time? Yes, Alyssa. I just want to add that while it, of course, is perfectly fine for any town counselor, including my friend Shalini, to ask us to repeat anything that's in a report, when we write a 23-page report, we really like to feel like maybe some people read it. So it's awesome if that happens. And if you have suggestions, just as we're going to be talking about the whole process, and how that's going to work as we move into the fall, we're going to have lots more conversations about process in general. Whether or not you want this level of detail of a report or other things included and other things left as an aside, we will look forward to hearing that as, as part of that conversation too because we realize these are very long reports to have to get through when we already have a whole bunch of other things in our agendas. But we wanted to give you everything, right, that shows all of our process. So um, we look forward to talking about the con, you know, how much to put in a report as well as the process itself in the future. Darcy. 
And I, I think we all know that OCA is going to be in the process of really looking, re-looking at our processes. And one of the things that we probably will also be looking at in the future is whether or not we want a firm term limits policy, um, which we don't, we don't have right now. So that could be something that the council wants and that we want in the future. We just don't, we didn't have that during this process. Dorothy. Well, I appreciate the long report. Um, this is one which somehow I didn't see and didn't get until tonight. Um, I did, in quickly skimming it, see that the question was brought up, which we've talked about before, which is about seeing the whole pool. And I may be wrong, so correct me, please. It, it seems that that hasn't been answered yet, that we can see the whole pool or see? You were provided with a document with the whole pool. We have the whole pool. The public does not have the pool, but we do. And with, with the qualifications? Yes. Okay. And, the, and each member on the council has uh, received the copies of the CAFs of the whole pool. Uh, wait, I tried tonight to find it on my computer when I realized I didn't have this document. I'd, I couldn't find it. I'd have to go back and look the, for the, it. But, the the yeah. CAFs would not be in the SharePoint. You should have an email from Angela Mills on June 3rd. Right. June right. 3rd email with the CAFs. Right. Thank you. All right. Further questions or comments? Yes. Shalini. I just want to clarify. I did read the report. <laughs> it, and it just a little confused for me because we had such a long discussion. And again, this is not pertaining to the particular candidate because I think everyone is excellent who's been appointed. It was just confusing to me reading that we had such a long discussion in a previous appointment why some very... Uh, you know, very very qualified people were let go off because they'd been in the, you know, they'd been for six years, and now we're appointing somebody who's been longer. And I, it wasn't, it just wasn't clear to me what, and 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 again, I don't want to obviously penalize the person, but I do want to speak to the process. Can we have some clarity and? consistency around what are we doing and why are we doing that and yeah yeah okay are there other comments particularly about this not the process or anything else because when we get to the process I'm sure we all have a lot of comments Yes, Evan. So the, the question of, of term limits has come up in the prior debate we had over planning board and ZBA. Um, it's come up in OCA. Um, so we, the, the select board right, had a, a policy um, of two terms, right? And so it's true that the council has never officially adopted that and OCA never officially adopted that. But I, I do think in many ways we're operating under policies um, that were set before us, and we're continuing them until we change them. Uh, OCA had a discussion before Planning Board and ZBA that basically said, we're not going to rigidly adhere to the term limits because we might get a pool of applicants who are unqualified or insufficient. Um, or we might feel like we really did need that institutional knowledge. And so one example of where we did that is um, by reappointing Mark Parent to a one-year term to the ZBA, despite him having served for a very long time, because there was a feeling that in this transition, we would want that institutional knowledge to carry over. I don't find that we're in that situation right now. Um, I think that we had a pool of people that had great expertise, expertise, many of which brought some institutional knowledge. The chair of the finance committee right now brings great institutional knowledge of finance committee. Um, and so my feeling was there was no need to suspend the term limits due to lack of qualifications or lack of expertise. Um, and this was a case where it would be really, uh, a, a, I mean, 11 years is a really long length of time when there are other very qualified people who could serve in this role. And to me, this was not a time to suspend uh, our, our general policy on term limits. Sarah. And just to make that clear, like Evan said, is so it was keeping institutional knowledge while still paying attention to term limits that have been in place 
before us, which would be two terms. So we're still paying attention to what had been before. We have not changed that, although we could. And then looking at what, what institutional knowledge and what other things you're looking for in the health of a committee. So similarly, uh, someone who had a, uh, who has been a chair, who had a lot of institutional knowledge was not there, except that in, the, in that we all talked about, was there still enough knowledge on the board and was this a better decision? So. I do think term limits is something that we've sort of talked about and covered and certainly could revisit. I, I think there are many things to revisit in this appointment. And um, at this hour, I don't think we are going to get into them, but I do expect that when we get to a review of the issue of term limits, the issue of uh, the process for appointments, et cetera, that this will be a full council discussion. It is not an OCA policy. It is a policy of the council. Okay. Are we ready to move to the motion? All right. The motion is to appoint the following individuals as non-voting resident members of the Town Council Finance Committee for a term to begin July 23rd, 2019 and expire on June 30th, 2020, Mary Lou Tileman. For a term to begin July 23rd, 2019 and expire June 30th, 2021, Sharon Povinelli and Robert Hegner. Do I hear a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Okay, Pat's a second. Andy? I would like to offer an amendment, and the amendment would be as follows. To add uh, to the end of the motion as presently presented the following. The council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointment to the vacancy that will occur on July 1, 2020, to assess how the addition of non-voting resident members has affected the committee and its work. Is that a motion? Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Further discussion on the motion. Could you yes, repeat Steve. that, Andy? I, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat it? Repeat the motion, please. I will repeat the motion, then if I may, uh, with it. the president, I'll speak to it also. Mm -hmm. uh, but to repeat the motion, it's to add to the end of the motion as presently stated the following. The council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointment to the vacancy that will occur on July 1, 2020, to assess how the addition of non-voting resident members has affected the committee and its work. And the reason that I put that forward, there were really two things. One is I wanted to acknowledge how hard OCA has worked on this and the amount that has happened already, which is uh, well stated in the rather lengthy OCA report that has been referred to um, several times. Um, and in that report, it notes that I met with OCA on October 24th and OCA posed three questions for finance committee consideration, one of which was, uh, Having been through one budget cycle, does the Finance Committee see a need for changing the description of what they seek in candidates, finance experience versus broader citizen perspective? And then the report goes on uh, to report that um, several members of the OCA Committee met with the Finance Committee the following day on June 25th where we were devoting virtually the entire meeting to talking about the Community Preservation Act proposal for 132 Northampton Road. And the OCA report states, <clears throat> and I read again, there appears to be a consensus that Finance Committee continues to, have not, uh, to want to have non-voting resident members. Um, we didn't really have a substantial time to discuss that. Um, but I do think that that was a fair conclusion of what was uh, discussed at the time. I'll leave that to other members of the committee if they want to um, add to that. But 
Um, the other thing that I want to then point out is that the council adopted the finance committee charge that includes um, having uh, the non-voting resident members pretty soon after the inauguration of the council and before we started our work and certainly before the finance committee started its work and um, in um, the intervening months we have experienced how the finance committee has functioned and hopefully you've had a chance to observe how the finance committee has functioned. Um, I have personally some concerns about whether the addition of three new members is going to change how our committee functions. Um, I s invite all of you to think about how your committee would function differently if three members were added to it. And um, suddenly, um, all of the time that you're putting into it, um, to your meetings, with the number of people that you have on your committees, is suddenly changed to add a substantial additional number that isn't quite doubling, but it's coming close to doubling the number of people there. In addition, um, I'll turn back to the rules of uh, procedure that we just did a first reading on, and 10.6i uh, talks about what the committee process is for um, producing reports and um, how to handle um, matters that are committee process matters. And I don't think that we've really, as a council or a committee or in any place, had the time to sit back and think, what does it mean when we're going to add members who are not members of the council to a committee? And um, I uh, think, so I, I, as I have pondered both of those questions, I've really uh, been concerned about how this is going to uh, move forward and whether it will affect what has become um, a very effective committee. And I thought about two different approaches. One was um, to exercise um, the right that I would have as a member of the council to ask to postpone the vote for one meeting. Um, <clears throat> I decided not to do that. I um, pointed out if others on the committee wish to do that, I certainly um, understand and uh, that they have the right to make that request. The reason that I decided not to go there is because of respect for OCA and respect for the people who applied for the committee. But it did get me back to the point of at least making the motion that I've offered, which was to require that we evaluate this um, before any further appointments are made, at the, which of course comes at the expiration of the one-year term that is being recommended for one of the three. There, a motion's been made, seconded, an amendment is now on the floor for discussion. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to the amendment? Could you just repeat it one more time? The motion was to add the following to the end of the motion as presented. The council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointment to the vacancy that will occur on July 1, 2020 to assess how the addition of non-voting resident members has affected the committee and its work. George. Would it be your understanding that then that would be sent to OCA and we would uh, look into it and then report back to you or do you envision having a 13 member discussion of this uh, for a couple of hours? I think that's a matter that the council would have to decide at the time. I don't think that, I, I did think about that and I felt that it was um, not appropriate to put that into the motion that I was suggesting um, because there could be other places that the council at that point might refer it, uh, probably is not 
um, as you indicate, appropriate for a 13-member discussion. But, uh, for example, how does the Finance Committee get involved in that discussion, too, uh, I think is an important thing that for uh, the Council to consider at the time. Dorsey. Uh, I would uh, like to, to separate the two parts of the motion. Can I move to amend the amendment? <laughs> Tell me what you'd like to do and then we'll figure out how to do it. In other words, have the amendment be a separate motion. I don't see how that can be. And why would you uh, want it to be a separate motion? It seems like two separate issues. The, the, the appointment of the three people and this other um, motion seems to be a separate issue, which could be fine, but I don't see how it's related to the appointment of the three people. Um, so I would move to do that if I knew how. <laughs> I think I, yeah, there is a way to do this. It's rude to separate the. So, so I think what will, hap what will happen is you will vote on the amendment first as a separate vote. And if that passes, then you vote on the main motion. If it fails, you still vote on the second, on your main motion. So I, there will be two different votes. I don't think that was the question. I think the question was, can we have this as just entirely two separate motions? We vote on this, and then there'll be a whole separate motion that we do the evaluation. That's the way I understood your question, Darcy. And there is a way in Robert's rules to split the question. And um, Alyssa? But it's not one question yet. So the, the only way to accomplish that thing, like we used to do at town meeting, would be to have a positive vote to amend it and then split it apart, which seems kind of insane in this particular yeah. case. So perhaps, like, Mr. Bachman was talking about, you know, you Just have the ahead. vote, what fails, and then you go back to the other thing. But to try and put it together and then split it, I'm not sure that Mr. Pistrang would have let us do it quite that way okay. on the floor of town meeting. All right. So then let's do it the way Mr. Bachman has described, which we vote on the amendment. Is there any further discussion about the amendment? Dorothy. Well, Andy said he thought about suggesting we postpone the vote and declined. Um, I see there are some advantages in not postponing the vote. This is very central to the Finance Committee, and a key member of the Finance Committee is not here tonight. So I, I guess I, I would like to postpone. So you're moving to postpone, and then that does it. Yes. Is that not the same thing you did before, is it? Well, then, then, then seriously, there must be a way to do this without that. Madam, Madam. Yes. So I, I don't have the charter in front of me, but I think that the nuclear option can't be, it has to be done before there's another motion on uh, it. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't yes. think it can be, I okay. think it has to be proposed before another motion. Okay. Yeah. All right. I agree with you on that. Um, So right now we are speaking to the amendment. Pat? Oh, okay. I, get, well, I guess I have a, I need a clarification. To me now, there is ultimately one vote. There is um, the acceptance of the three people or rejection of the three people or, um, and then the uh, saying at the end of um, um, June 2020 or July 2020, we will uh, look at residents, uh, non-voting members, residents on the Finance Committee. So those two things are now tied together. If we vote on the amendment and it, go, it is not, it happens, 
I'm not sure why why it isn't one motion. You you vote on the amendment, now. and then the amendment, if it passes, it becomes part of the original motion. Gotcha. And then All you right. vote on the original Thank motion. Thank you. I needed that extra yeah. clarification. May I also point out that there are other um, options for review. In fact, I believe the charter requires that we re-review re all committees, but yeah, uh, not charter, the rules of procedure. Um, Evan? Uh, okay. So first I have a clarifying question for Andy, which was you said review the finance process. Do you mean the, what it, I don't know what you mean by that. Andy. Yeah. Um, I was going back to get a look at the exact wording uh, as Hyphen put it forward. I think that the reason that I wanted to look at the finance, what I was really talking about is how the finance committee is functioning. Because as I pointed out, adding three members could really be a benefit to the, to the committee. It could be a detriment to the committee. We don't know if we don't try. And I, and I think that's why I put, uh, part of the reason that I put the two together is that if we're going to go ahead and do it, um, then we should at least be clear that we need to be committed to looking at whether this has been a benefit or a detriment to um, the committee process before we go forward and appoint anybody else again. And uh, if it, it seemed that, um, as I said, I, uh, if we, my, my preference was to just go ahead and proceed and support what OCA has um, done so far, but I wanted to make it clear before any other appointment or reappointment is made for any of these positions that there be a process to thoroughly look at whether this has been a benefit or a detriment to the Finance Committee as a working group and to the Council as what it expects and receives from the Committee. And um, when I pointed out that rule question, um, there was there's also this um, peculiarity that, again, I have to ask all of you to think about for your committees which is um, minority report. Um, we're now putting in a very un unusual situation where there are three people who are not members of the council. They were not elected by the public, the electorate at large. Um, and we are giving them the status of members of a committee but theoretically, the way that that rule is written would have the right to participate in the minority report. And uh, I think that we really need to take a pause before we continue with this process by doing even a, a reappointment and think about that. Because the, the other thing I had thought about, as I said, was to invoke the nuclear option to give the Finance Committee an opportunity to, to have this discussion more fully, because I don't think we have, but um, I didn't exercise that. So there is a motion on the floor, and the motion has been amended, and the amendment has been seconded. Is there anybody else who wants to speak to the amendment? Dorsey. I just have a question. You're saying that the council will have a discussion after a year, and at that point, one term will be complete. Two of the terms will not be complete. They'll be two-year terms. So we would be deciding as a council whether we wanted to continue the people that already had unfinished terms? <laughs> I, think the, I think that I assume the council will have to deal with that at the time if it um, wishes it uh, to do so. i not trying to pre predict what, where we will be a year from now. The, if the council chose a year, 
it, leading up to July 1st, 2020, if the council chose to change the, uh, the charge of the committee in any way, and specifically with regard to this, whether or not there were non-resident members of the committee, if the council voted to can discontinue non-resident members of the committee, I believe that would mean that those members that were appointed for two years would not complete their terms. I think it would be, it would be similar to dissolving a committee. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if we go back in for any of the myriad committees that exist in town government, um, voted to discontinue a committee, then people who've been appointed, their terms end when the committee is discontinued. So I guess that would be the analogy I would put forward. I've had my term ended. <laughs> um, Alyssa. So obviously we just heard about this amendment tonight. And so um, I do appreciate though the thought behind it and the attachment to the actual, I appreciate that it may enable some people to vote for this that may not have been otherwise able to do so, knowing that we will have a more formal process of discussing it in addition to what's already written into our rules about looking at things. And certainly that conversation, as you know from the report, did come up, do we even, given that we said it was okay to wait, well then we waited and then people got their process going before these people came on, and so does it actually make sense? And I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect the council some well where before, well before June 30th, to have had a real conversation about this. And I don't want anyone, please, to do the nuclear option because I don't believe that the finance committee having a meeting about this is going to solve the problem in the short term. I think in the short term, I think we would end up with the same place of, well, we said we would try it, so let's try it. And then let's look and see what happens. It seems like it would be very strange for the finance committee to finally to come to a place in the next couple of weeks to say, you know, we don't want these people anymore. That, that just doesn't seem likely. And so given that, I don't see the point to, to postponing. And so that's why I think that this compromise makes sense. Dorothy. I really don't remember in the finance committee where we all said, yes, it's a great idea to have. I, I remember saying, well, you were going to think about it, we were going to talk about it, but I don't remember that we firmly committed ourselves to it. Yes, Aunt Pat. Um, I've been holding back be, uh, because I'm not sure exactly where my comment goes. It seems to me that the uh, having resident members of the, non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee is an important thing to do because it um, opens us up to minority opinions, possibly, but it opens us up to three more um, uh, collaborators, three more idea makers, three more people looking at uh, a complex, um, budget a complex financial world fi and complex financial questions. Um, I didn't bring it up because I thought I'd wait till we discussed it uh, after a year. Uh, but I think I need to bring it up now because, you know, I feel like, Andy, you're presenting very strongly. You're feeling it'll interfere with your committee. I actually, on a couple of my committees, would really like a couple more people um, for a variety of reasons, all of them positive. Um, and I, I feel like we need to move forward and not stop this. Not I, that it's a easy out. It's a it's a waste of our time. Are there additional comments to the amendment, Shalini? I'm I'm still a little confused, but I will try to articulate. I'm trying to understand the the if we. If you're going to appoint three re residents, then and then have this new rule added, how does that sound to them? Like they came in with a certain assumption, and then now we're like, but in a year we're going to. I mean, they weren't told that. It's weird. They're on probation. Darcy. 
yeah. Uh, I would That's actually, an inaccurate yeah. description. I would actually... Uh, I'm uh, not yeah. saying that's the way it should be. That's what it sounds like. I would agree with uh, Shalini on that, and also I, it seem it seems like if the reason that we would be doing this is because we want um, we don't want differing opinions. I mean, I think that's the whole purpose of adding um, resident non-voting members is just to to have some new voices. Who, they might possibly have differing opinions. We don't know, um, but we we want to be open to all voices in town. So um, I am I'm confused by that being a reason why after a year. I mean, I, again, I feel like it would be chilling to people coming on to this committee if if they heard that if after a year we saw that they had expressed some dissent about something, they're off, you know? <laughs> so uh, it, it, it doesn't, that doesn't feel right to me. Can I, um, I'm going to step out of my role as president, as I periodically do when I want to ex express an opinion. Um, I just, I want to pick up on something Andy said. And I'd like each of you on the committees that you're on, whether it's OCA, GOL, and think about the people who might like to be on those committees because they don't like what you're doing, the process, et cetera. They have plenty of opportunity. They come for public comment. They can write us. They can be there at hearings. But this is, this is one thing the charter allowed we decided to try it, and what I think Andy is suggesting is that we evaluate it. And we may decide after a year, based on various pieces of input, that it didn't work. That messing, m m meshing a council committee with non-council members that aren't voting leads to confusion, may lead to confusion, may, thank you for that correction, may lead to confusion. It's just a statement of evaluating it. It's a, an option that was provided in the charter. We as a council very early on chose to exercise that option. We went back and forth through many a discussion about length of terms, appointments, who should appoint, who should be involved in the interviews. This particular item on our agenda has come up many times. And right now we're sitting with three appointments and the amendment is basically to say, given that it's come up several different times as to whether or not this is a good idea, who should make these appointments, et cetera, or who should do the interviews, we're just saying give it a year and see what it's like. That's what the amendment's about, Evan. Thank you for that. I think that was actually really useful. So I wasn't sure where I stood on this amendment until like five minutes ago. So I'm glad we've had this discussion. Um, I, I want to first say, I, just to correct the record a little bit, that um, our understanding on OCA, which I think was the understanding of the council, was that the non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee were never intended to bring differing views or dissent. Mm -hmm. It was intended to bring expertise that perhaps might not be on the right. committee, understanding that elected officials don't always come with financial expertise. Um, and so I, 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 I'm concerned about any characterization that Andy's trying to do this to keep off differing opinions or we would kick off anyone who would uh, dissent. That was never the intention of adding people on to the first place. Um, but I think that the concept of having a non-voting committee members can feel very strange um, and I think that it's a unique situation. And in the end, given what Darcy said and what Lynn said, um, I, I'm planning to vote in favor of the motion because I think it is useful to have a conversation in a year. And it, it might be awkward, but you know, so is voting for people whose names are public, right? Sometimes things are awkward. We've done awkward. <laughs> 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 On, 
It, let's go with final comments. George. Uh, very quick. Um, I just feel like we'd have this conversation anyway. I don't see the need of this amendment since this is a conversation we clearly will be having, um, whether there's an amendment or not. Um, so I and also have a sense like this does send a message to the people that will be appointed. They may not even know about it, so maybe it won't matter. But um, it, this is a conversation we're going to have anyway. So I don't see the point of this amendment. Um, so I'm not going to vote for it. Darcy. I, I was just going to say exactly the same thing, that we can do this without, a, without an amendment. We can just bring it up in a year. We have, we have the ability to do that at any time. Okay. Alyssa. While that's true, I actually, for the exact reason you said, want to include it so that they, are, so they know mm -hmm. that we are going to do this. That is why to have the amendment is so they know we are going to do this. That's, that is, that's actually what sold me on it, <laughs> so that they know that we are doing this. I think that's totally reasonable. If it really, really upsets people, then change the terms all to one year. That's, that's the other option, is change all the terms to one year and be done with it. Okay. We, have an, we have an amendment on the table at this point <laughs> to do this evaluation prior to July 1. Is there any further conversation about that amendment? Okay, I call the question. All those, shall, I'd like the motion to be read. Athena? The council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointment to the vacancy that will occur on July 1, 2020 to assess the, how the addition of non-voting resident members has affected the committee and its work. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Keep them raised for, so that we have a... And this is one of those that votes you have to publish by tomorrow sometime. <laughs> okay. Do you have it all? Athena? Uh, opposed. Okay. Abstain. And two, three people not present. So the motion passes. Seven to four. And so the, mo the motion now that's on the table is the motion that includes the three people, their terms, and this amendment. Is anybody like to speak to the motion? Call the question. Okay. I'll call the question. All those in favor of the following motion, which is to appoint the following individuals as non-voting members, resident members of the Town Council Finance Committee for the terms beginning July 23 and expiring July 30th, 2020, Mary Lou Tileman for a term to begin July 23, 2019 and expire June 30th, 2021, Sharon Povinelli, Robert Hegner, the council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointment to the vacancy that will occur on July 1st, 2020, to assess how the addition of non-voting resident members have affected the committee and its work. I call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All those in favor of the motion. This is the original motion as amended. Okay. The original motion as amended. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Abstain. Okay. And three absent. Okay. So the Looks motion like passed. I'm sorry? Final vote. The final vote was? Nine, two. Nine in favor, two opposed, no abstentions, three absent. Two absent. 
two absent, I'm sorry. Nine in favor, two opposed, no abstentions, and two absent. Thank you. Okay, moving on. By the way, the Finance Committee meets tomorrow at, four, at 2 o'clock, just to be clear. Um, okay. Um, committee reports. Audit Committee. Um, the Audit Committee um, has not met, but will be meeting in August after I meet with Sonia Aldridge to understand the RFP process for... Okay. Uh, Bylaw Review. Uh, the bylaw review committee. We've had a lively discussion, a robust discussion of the Mullen rule and how it affects planning and zoning and meeting attendance. Um, and we're going to be starting our next meeting by looking at the net zero energy bylaw to clarify two different definitions that are um, uh, involved. One about plant building site um, it's defined in the bylaw, but it's not used anywhere. And also project site, which has, is used, but is not designed or uh, clarified. That's all. Okay. Um, Community Resource Committee. The CRC met this week, and we continued, well, actually concluded just, just uh, Discussion of goals as it aligns to mm -hmm. the town council goals, we forwarded those to, to our president. We also continued our review of the master plan. Uh, we had a robust <laughs> discussion about the public art proposal and basically how to move that forward. So, the, and I know that we're at the 45 days, so we have not done anything other than to discuss with the proposers. Uh, of um, how do we move it forward. But because it's been referred to two different committees, mm -hmm. we feel that we can't form a subcommittee to look at this. So we, we sort of, we need the, the president's help on how to move this forward. Um, so at this point, let me just say that it is on the uh, finance committee agenda for tomorrow. Yeah. And perhaps we'll have better ideas then on how to move it, the discussion forward. You have actually fulfilled your responsibility by coming to report to us with an update. So you're still within the letter of the law, okay? okay. Um, the Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee, uh, we actually met, but we did not have a quorum. I used the opportunity to integrate everything I've been given into one document. We'll be polling the committee and having a meeting, and that document will become part of the basis for our discussion at our retreat in September. Uh, finance committee. Yeah, well, you now have heard many times that the finance committee is meeting tomorrow, <laughs> and uh, we will be um, taking up percent for arts. Uh, and just to add to that a little bit, is also as a member of CRC, we had in, in a discussion as to um, the appointment of a work group, and one of the things that had held us up a little bit was that the uh, rules of procedure that has to deal with appointment of work groups um, is still itself something in progress, um, and that was part of the dilemma in trying to tie two committees together and think about creating a process that doesn't exist. Uh, the, the other thing that's uh, on for tomorrow, I sent you a notice about it. I just wanted to remind you, and there was a little bit of it in the um, presentation that the president made about the uh, DPW and the fire station buildings. But we think that it's really important for the finance committee and invite the entire council to the meeting to hear a presentation that we're going to receive about how building processes work in a little bit more detail where you talk about how you go from um, initial design, um, feasibility studies to um, schematic design, what the OPM process is all about, the approval process for funding, how contracting occurs, and construction through to completion and acceptance of the building after completion. Um, one of the things that um, Mr. Schreiber pointed out was that there were actually two different processes for procuring construction services for public buildings. 
one known as the design build bid build process and the other construction manager at risk process um, and there are statutory sections and mass general laws that apply to those um, that will be included in the presentation tomorrow um, and we will be taking that up first thing at the beginning of our meeting um, if you can't make it and you're really interested uh, hopefully Amherst Media will be with us and it will be available thank you let me just mention we have not called that as a committee of the whole so if you do come it'll be to just be part of the audience okay um, and hopefully we'll get done by six o'clock to get to Fort River <laughs> um, GOL Evan two quick things I mentioned since you've heard quite a bit from GOL tonight uh, one is again uh, we are meeting this Wednesday uh, when we intend to discuss uh, work group rules. We are not voting on any rules then. It's simply a discussion. Um, GOL has had a thorough debate on this already. Um, one thing I will say is if there are members of rules of procedure who were heavily invested in the concept of work group, we would welcome you to come to our meeting um, because we are working as a new committee, as a separate committee. Um, our only member who is also on rules of procedure mandy joe will be absent um at the wednesday's meeting so if you were a rules of procedure proponent of work groups we would love to hear from you as to what you were envisioning as we struggle through this uh, the one other thing i want to mention is that at the council's july 1 meeting uh, we were referred the process under charter section 7.6 publication of candidate statements on the town bulletin board uh, uh, mandy joe as chair of gol drafted an uh, an email to town attorney asking for town attorney input um, sent that to the town manager who sent it off to town attorney and so uh, we were told to report back by today and our report is we've emailed the attorney and we're, we'll find out if it's even possible you fulfilled the requirements of the motion thank you, thank you. um quick, uh, oka quick, uh, quick question I'm sorry yes could you t tell us when is the gol meeting wednesday at 10 30 a.m in this room Okay, thank you. Uh, Oka? No further report from Oka. Okay. Uh, we have approval of minutes for July 1st, 2019. Uh, let's put the motion on the floor and then see where we are. To approve the July 1st, 2019 Town Council meeting minutes as presented. Do I hear a motion? I move. Second. Second. Steinberg, second. Uh, any further? Questions, corrections, additions? Okay, then call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Uh, I need to have you keep your hands up. Opposed? Abstain. So the vote was eight four zero against three abstentions and two absent. Okay. Um, town manager's report highlights. Highlights. Um, so thank you. It's hard hard to believe that this weekend was so hot since people are shivering in here but it was kind of a brutal weekend. Um, I just want to commend the police, fire, library, communications, LSSE, uh, DPW school, uh, maintenance, IT. Everybody was on duty this weekend addressing uh, a giant lacrosse tournament that was causing consternation in the neighborhood at the high school. Um, the impacts on our pools and in parking. Um, Traffic lights, the main traffic light downtown being out, phones being down at the, at the um, certain phones being down at the police station, air conditioning tripping in, uh, in the town hall and at the police station, even though we declared the police station one of our cooling zones. Um, 
And so there was a lot going on this weekend, and staff were in addressing all these things and just and facility. I didn't mention facilities; they were working all weekend as well. So, uh, when you have hot weather or very cold weather, these things happen, um, and it's sort of we understand it. We're, we're, we think about it in advance, um, but it, it we got through the weekend, um, learned some things, and so just can thank you to all the employees that that stepped up and came over and and, and addressed the situations. Um, the a couple other things. Uh, so Puffers Pond, it, it, it was very busy this weekend. People, there's some parking issues that the police started to address, and um, but otherwise pretty well managed and, and working. That the new traffic pattern seems to be working pretty well. The um, as you all know, the Station Road Bridge is open. Uh, my first call, two things, one, several people thanking us, but also one person saying keep it, as I mentioned, just keep it just as it is. We don't want a brand new, big, multi-lane bridge. We're happy the way it is. So, um, but I, what I, my response to that is that we don't want to build a new bridge until we get state funding. Um, the, the odd part of this is that because our bridge is actual, actually passable, it lowers down the ranking because they tend to pay, pay for bridges that are impassable, so we've hurt ourselves, but this is, I think, really important for the neighborhood to have a place to pass through, and I think that it looks really attractive, actually. They did a really nice job. Um, the um, Craig's Doors, you've heard about the staff all announced their resignation effective August 1. Uh, we have had conversations with our state rep, state senator, with the major funding source at the HCD. Uh, they get about, $175,000 of their budget comes from DHCD. They get about 15,000, I understand, from the United Way. They private raise around $30,000, and that's pretty much their budget. So DHCD is the major component of their budget, and they will pretty much decide who and what will happen with Craig's stores. Everyone is committed to having the shelter open. On, you know, on November 1st as it's planned to, and I think we will achieve that. How, it get, how we get there is going to be another question. The next step is for DHCD to come in and do an analysis of the site and of the finances of Craig's Doors. Uh, they expect to do that this week. They're, they are on it. They're actively investigating, uh, and they will come up with a recommendation. Um, Julie Fetterman, our health director, is the lead on this for the town. Um, she has been working in this area for a long time. It, it, it's the staff who resigned were really excellent staff. It's a real loss that they are all leaving, but it's also an opportunity because we see the, the shelter as part of a regional uh, uh, approach to addressing the problem of uh, homelessness. Um, and um, so it's we're, so many years the town looked at the Craig Stores as our own little shelter, but it doesn't. It works in a larger um, relationship with other shelters, and this may be an opportunity for us to have that broader conversation. And there are people in the region, uh, Hampshire and Franklin County, and even Hamden County, who want to engage in that conversation. And the state has the wherewithal to bring all those people together. Uh, the board. Board of Trustees, the uh, Board of Directors of Craig's Doors had been trying to do this, work with some other agencies, but there was never enough um, uh, opportunity there for the other agencies to come in. But they have an uh, appropriation from the state. They have a location. I think they might be attractive to some other agencies at this point in time. So we're optimistic. Um, but it might not be exactly the way it has been in the past. So we'll see. It's really going to be up to the state. Um, Three other things. Uh, Hampshire College has a new president, and he starts on August 6th, I think it is, 7th, something like that. Um, I have not met him, but he'll, he, he'll be in town relatively soon. We continue to have conversations with the university on the strategic partnership agreement. Um, I've, I've included a copy of the existing strategic partnership agreement as part of my town manager report, if you're interested in looking at that. Um, we're trudging along. Uh, we've, the town has gone in and said we don't want just a rollover of what we have currently. So it's become much more um, engaged and um, elongated kind of conversation that we're having with, with representatives from the university. Um, it's, I expect that I will give you a full 
update uh, with more detail come September. We hope we have an agreement by then. If we don't, I'll, I would expect that you would have me give a full explanation of why we don't have an agreement by then. Um, and the last thing I want to mention was that um, we're looking at uh, adjusting some things on our website. So that, uh, just, a, just as a one-off thing on this is, is that um, the charter calls for a references things being posted on the bulletin board. It says the town website can be the bulletin board. There's nothing on our website that says bulletin board. So we're looking at putting a section of the website that says this is the bulletin board. If it's referenced, it says it'll be posted on the bulletin board. Here's where you will find it. Just to make it easier for people because we can post jobs next to a public hearing notice and it's both in the charter says it should be posted on the bulletin board but it'd be in two totally different locations so just something we're exploring to try and make it easier for people to find notices and things like that and people know where to go so that's what I've got. I open for are there questions. questions or comments Dorothy two, two questions um, the young women who resigned from Craig's doors mm -hmm. um, Often when people resign, and I would have to say, I think more often when women resign, they're doing it to make a point. It doesn't mean that they don't want to do the job. And I just want to make sure that when whatever needs to be straightened out gets straightened out, that they are considered, to, if they want to, to come back to their jobs. Because, I mean, I haven't talked to them. I don't even know what they were referring to, but I just know from, say, from my own background that when somebody resigns, it's not because they necessarily want to leave. It's just the only way they can get their point across. Well, that might be the case in this situation for them. Um, they, are, they were employees of Craig's Doors, and the board of directors would be the employer and to, would make the decision whether they come back or not, or if they want to come back. You had a second question. Yes, I thought it was great that you opened the pools, and you may have to do that a lot more this summer. I'm just wondering, how do you get the lifeguards on such short notice? Uh, we had been talking about this uh, earlier in the week in preparation. We, we were sort of waiting uh, t till later in the week to decide if the weather was going to be uh, that bad. So we had talked to the, the lifeguards in advance about extending the pool hours. So we decided that we would extend the pool hours and make the pools free. Um, until eight, extend until eight o'clock and make the pools free. And they were very popular um, for this, both, both pools. Steve. So, so living near the high school, it did look like Woodstock. You know, it, uh, so what was the, um, I call it the invasion of the really big cars, because, but the, um, was it, it seemed unmanaged. So was that one of the issues that? Um, this is a very large lacrosse tournament yeah. um, with, uh, teams from uh, eight to ten year olds who were the youngest players were playing at the high school. Uh, the older students who were all high school students were at the university. The university has several of its fields under construction. They're putting turf down on Boyden Field. So those were unavailable to uh, this tournament. Um, the university is very gracious and allowed us to have many of our team sports on their fields in May when our fields were unplayable. And so the athletic director felt it was quid pro quo to allow them to use our fields when they needed fields. And it was a reasonable um, request and a reasonable response. What we did not anticipate is the number of cars, um, frankly, the arrogance of the people who are driving the cars and feeling that they don't care where you tell them they should park, they were gonna park under the shade or on the grass, wherever it was. And that was the frustrating thing. The tournament organizers were superb at cooperating uh, hiring police de details when we told them they needed to. Um, if there's any damage to any property, fields or non-fields, they're, they're prepared to pay for it. Um, superintendent was excellent in being in touch with everyone over the weekend as well. Um, so uh, um, I think that you had college kids who were, trying, who were there at, starting at 5.45 in the morning trying to direct people where to go, but some people just didn't care. And I've had direct contact with some people and they basically said, give me a ticket, I don't care. Um, so, and that, and it, but and the problem for us was that same attitude problem uh, merged into parking at Puffer's Pond, which is where and it, and it becomes apparent when you have a very large, fancy car with a New York or Pennsylvania or Connecticut license plate on it. That's those people aren't usually making Puffer's Pond a destination. 
And then also happened at our pools, honestly, and where some of our lifeguards uh, felt they were um, not being listened to when they were instructing people on how they should behave in the pools. And they were, you know, little cross players, typically, from this tournament. And so we did a good thing, but the one thing we did, we did, we, uh, the DPW is very cooperative on uh, community field. They moved, which is, they have their office or their facility for parks and rec. They moved all their vehicles onto the grass. We blocked that off. We had a lifeguard sitting out there and said resident parking only for use of community pool because there was no place to put your cars. The middle school parking lot was jammed. The high school parking lot was jammed. Um, so we did have a space that we carved out for residents who needed to go to the pool. Okay. Evan. So there were lots of exciting things in your town manager report, but what is perhaps a sign of how sad my life has become is <laughs> the most exciting one was that you're going to have a town bulletin board part of the <laughs> website. Because that, that has really been an issue, and I think... Uh, that was something I recently asked the GOL chair to put on our agenda of what is the town bulletin board and what does it mean to have all of these things on the website. So as expeditiously as that could be done would make me so happy. We are on it. Wait, I have to the, tell the you, gentleman from, if that's uh, all it takes, Paul, go for it. The gentleman from District 4 needs to get out more. Right, yes. Yeah. A little more vacation for you. All right, Alyssa? I was going to say thank you for taking one of my four items, Evan, so I only have three. Um, in regards to the, it's, it is actually very important, ranked choice voting, I'm, uh, I don't need an answer now, but in reading your report again, it's saying that the state legislature is talking about ranked choice voting bills, Lauren Goldberg coming to talk to us, which makes me uneasy that we don't actually have the ability to establish ranked choice voting, which our charter requires. But the implication from the report, if I'm not reading it incorrectly, is that maybe we can't just do it because we want to. I don't know the answer. That's why we're going to have our So that's meeting. exciting for all of us. So, okay, <laughs> moving on. Then the other is in regards to the shelter, just again, I appreciate all the perspective you gave us on that. And I would like to make it clear that while, of course, we don't own the shelter anymore because we stopped being the main funding source for it a long time ago. We do put a ton of people resources into it in terms of various departments going in there, right. but we don't hand the money anymore like we used to. And we've never owned their employees, right? That's always been their board or previous organizations' boards that were there. But I do want to make clear when DHCD comes in, I hope it is expressed to them that the reason we agreed to have a shelter in this community included the fact that it was going to include both men and women, that it was going to include cooked food, not just prepackaged granola bars, and that it was going to be behavior-based. So if any of those things are going to change based on either DHCD's input, because we are unusual in this way in having the shelter that is a regional shelter. We do have people in the, in the community who don't agree with the decisions that we made in those three areas, but we did make those decisions actively. So I'm hoping, I, what I'm asking is that we please don't just have those decisions change without there being another community conversation. Because if, for example, DHCD says, you know what, you know what you need to do, you just need to have men and no, and no cooked food. There needs to be another conversation here in the community because one of the reasons we've had this organization is because we wanted those things. So I appreciate that being shared. And then the other thing is in regards to the UMass Strategic Partnership Agreement. I realize it sounds like things are not going exactly as easy as they might have been, but I want to be clear that before it's presented to us as a final document, that we find a way to have a conversation as a town council with the town manager as to these are why these things are in it. These are the, without giving away the negotiating position, these are the other things that I'm thinking of having in it. Because what I don't want is I don't want it to be presented to us at the end and have a, a bunch of us say, well, wait, I don't know why you did that. I don't want to authorize you to sign that because then that puts them in a worse position. So I hope we can find a way to do that. I assume that could be done in an executive session. We have to check on that. Okay, Shalini. Uh, I had a question about the flood mapping project and what implications that has on landowners and how are they being informed about it and have what has been 
uh, coming, showing up for people, like the 20 people who att attended, were there any concerns? Uh, I don't know the answer if there were concerns or not. The, this has been in the works for a couple years now. It's gone to town meeting a, for funding a couple times already. Um, the implications, it's, uh, for, it changes the lines of where potential flooding is, so it does has imp have impact on property owners, some for better, some for worse. Um, I, I would have to, I would defer to Chris Brestrup to get more in more detail and she can come in and explain that more. But um, I just know that it's been a pretty lengthy involved process. Um, and that's why they put it, they've been trying to do as much publicity as they can. They don't go in, you know, in, inform every property owner, I don't think. So. Okay. Uh, they'll find out if their insurance suggests they have to have flood insurance. I hate to say it, but that's that's how it translates. Yes, Evan. So w one other thing. Uh, so when, on July 1, we asked the town manager um, to start the conversation with the town attorney about the charter sections regarding lowering the voting age and allowing uh, non-citizens to vote. The town manager has emailed the attorney. He re gave us the reply, which seems to be the answer is, we cannot do it without special legislation. Um, I guess my question, which is maybe more for the council, is have we fulfilled our charter requirement to investigate the possibility under, what was it, 1010 B and C? And if so, are we stopping this conversation or are we continuing? What now that we have this opinion, what, what's, what's next, or is it nothing? The thing that strikes me as you ask that question is that we also know that every city and town that has come forward to the state legislature to ask for any of these kinds of exceptions have been refused. Are we going to spend our time trying to get to the point that we take something to the legislature and, like everyone else, refused. So I would think that at some point you'd want it on your agenda so that you and the public can engage in the conversation. Um, and then you would have to make exactly that decision. Okay. And if you take it to the legislature, how much, you know, effort are you going to be putting into it? Some, you know, it used to be that the town would every year file the same thing over and over. Um, but I think you'd also want to engage your, your state senator and state representative to say, what is your advice on this? We, it's something we would like to do. We understand the, the limitations of what we're allowed to do. It's all rest with the state. But I think having it on the agenda as okay. an explicit item would be the best this way to do it. This is at the time then to do it. We will. Darcy. Is there pending legislation? For which? Uh, for the non for the non citizen voting, there are a couple bills that I referenced one in in the uh, in the report. There are mm -hmm. a couple bills that are being reviewed by the state, um, but the, it, what I'm told is none of them are going to move. But they're they've had a hearing or something like that. So yeah. we could support them. Mm -hmm. Are there any question, further questions on the town manager's report? Okay, then moving on, uh, just, I had, I had one quick one. yes. It was a question about um, that this is about w w whether there's gonna be a hired minute taker for committees. Any action on that? Yes, so um, the school department is doing the same thing. I reviewed a job ad for that today. Um, so we're looking with the school department to hire people who will do this job. Um, so that could go out as early as this week. And it would be hourly? Hourly paid, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we may have one person who takes on a lot of committees, but my expectation is that we'd have one person per committee. We'd like there some, to be some allegiance to the committee, but we'd have a stable of people who could step in. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Uh, any further comments? Okay. Under town council comments, just two things. Um, I did refer the Row Act resolution to GOL on July 8th. Um, this was based on our conversation this last time that all resolutions, if at all possible, would be reviewed by GOL before they come before the committee. And it was reviewed and it was considered 
um, I'm, I'm going to get your words, Evan. I have them right here. Declared it clear, consistent, and actionable. But we voted on it earlier, and thank you very much. For, yes, Pat. I know that we're tied up in the next few uh, council meetings, but I would like to get back to having uh, future agenda items being listed. We do it in GOL, right. and it's very helpful. Right. Um, okay. The other one was the referral for the Director of Senior Services. That appointment was referred to OCA on July 9th, 2019, and obviously we went ahead and acted on that. Uh, the future agenda items. You've mentioned you'd like to see the list. We're trying to get it refined. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anything else on future agenda items? I've written down a couple, so yes. Uh, Councillor comments, Lisa, marijuana? <laughs> Thank you. Now or later? <laughs> Are you offering? Hi. <laughs> I, 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 I know you may find this very, to be a rather much of a prude, but I won't have not darkened their doors. <laughs> so there's still process unfolding. Um, the town manager obviously at any point could speak and, and does in his town manager reports about the internal review team that is looking at actual applicants who are opening, tr attempting to open businesses. Some of you have been to the community meetings. There's another one coming up in a couple of weeks as I understand it. So you watch for the postings of those coming through for a people actually intending to open businesses. In terms of things like social consumption and delivery, there are, in fact, draft regulations that have been written associated with that. I did serve on the Social Consumption Working Group for the Cannabis Control Commission. We didn't get everything we wanted in the draft regulations, including the idea of events was dropped. Um, but there is a comment period that's open right now. It is intended that at least a couple of us uh, locally in the marijuana internal working group, including Mr. Kravitz, Ms. Fetterman, Ms. Brestrup, Connie Kruger, myself, would potentially attend a hearing that's going to be in Springfield on those draft regulations to offer our comments based on the work we've been doing over the last four or five years on marijuana here in this community. It is a long way off to look at a possible social consumption pilot model at this point, even if it's voted in September that it's included in the regulations, which is not a done deal. There's still a legislative piece that would have to take place before any communities could actually opt in. Then there's a process in terms of how you actually opt in with the state, and there's a whole bunch of steps after that. So there will not be an offer to go to a weed cafe anytime soon after a town council meeting, because there won't be one. But those, thi those things are being looked at, and I know also at the same time that the planning board is considering the possibility of changing the buffer zones around uh, items other than retail, so types of establishments other like re like cultivation and uh, testing and that sort of thing here in Amherst to enable more of those businesses to open with less focus on the retail, which has been our primary focus, although Mr. Kravitz is always working to attract those other types of businesses here too. And if you have additional questions, I would be happy to answer them at some other point. Okay. Any other comments at this time from the council? Okay, um, we had one other item that was uh, brought forth with less than 48 hours notice, and it is a testimony in support of House Resolution uh, 2836 and Senate Resolution 1958. Uh, these are both bills, I'm sorry, and it's the 100% Renewable Energy Act. Darcy developed a um, draft, it's in, been in your folder since um, th uh, Friday, and uh, if there is no objections, I would go ahead and sign it. Are there any changes to it at this point? And do you feel the need to vote? To support the letter. I'll move to support the letter. Okay. Second? Pat? Second. Okay. Then are there any changes or additions? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, unanimous, uh, I'm sorry, 11 zero, zero, with two absent. Um, are there any other business that I haven't anticipated at this point? Then can I have a motion to adjourn? 
Second. second. George is the second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It was unanimous.